Chapter Twenty Two of Ambassador Morgenthau's Story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Turk reverts to the ancestral type. The withdrawal of the Allied fleet from the Dardanelles had consequences which the world does not yet completely understand. The practical effect of the event, as I have said, was to isolate the Turkish Empire from all the world excepting Germany and Austria. England, France, Russia, and Italy, which for a century had held a restraining hand over the Ottoman Empire, had finally lost all power to influence or control. The Turks now perceived that a series of dazzling events had changed them from cringing dependence of the European powers into free agents. For the first time in two centuries they could now live their national life according to their own inclinations and govern their peoples according to their own will. The first expression of this rejuvenated national life was an episode which, so far as I know, is the most terrible in the history of the world. New Turkey, freed from European tutelage, celebrated its national rebirth by murdering not far from a million of its own subjects. I can hardly exaggerate the effect which the repulse of the Allied fleet produced upon the Turks. They believed that they had won the really great decisive battle of the war. For several centuries, they said, the British fleet had victoriously sailed the seas and had now met its first serious reverse at the hands of the Turks. In the first moments of their pride, the young Turk leaders saw visions of the complete resurrection of their empire. What had for two centuries been a decaying nation had suddenly started on a new and glorious life. In their pride and arrogance, the Turks began to look with disdain upon the people that had taught them what they knew of modern warfare, and nothing angered them so much as any suggestion that they owed any part of their success to their German allies. Why should we feel any obligations to the Germans, Enver would say to me? What have they done for us which compares with what we have done for them? They have lent us some money and sent us a few officers, it is true. But see what we have done? We have defeated the British fleet, something which neither the Germans nor any other nation could do. We have stationed armies on the Caucasian front, and so have kept busy large bodies of Russian troops that would have been used on the western front. Similarly, we have compelled England to keep large armies in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, and in that way we have weakened the Allied armies in France. No, the Germans could never have achieved their military successes without us. The shoe of obligation is entirely on their foot. This conviction possessed the leaders of the Union and Progress Party, and now began to have a determining effect upon Turkish national life and Turkish policy. Essentially, the Turk is a bully and a coward. He is brave as a lion when things are going his way, but cringing, abject, and nerveless when reverses are overwhelming him. And now that the fortunes of war were apparently favoring the empire, I began to see an entirely new Turk unfolding before my eyes. The hesitating and fearful Ottoman, feeling his way cautiously amid the mazes of European diplomacy, and seeking opportunities to find an advantage for himself in the divided councils of the European powers, gave place to an upstanding, almost dashing figure, proud and assertive, determined to live his own life, and absolutely contemptuous of his Christian foes. I was really witnessing a remarkable development in race psychology, an almost classical instance of reversion to type. The ragged, unkempt Turk of the twentieth century was vanishing, and in his place was appearing the Turk of the fourteenth and the fifteenth, the Turk who had swept out of his Asiatic fastnesses, conquered all the powerful peoples in his way, and founded in Asia, Africa, and Europe one of the most extensive empires that history has known. If we are properly to appreciate this new Talat and Enver and the events which now took place, we must understand the Turk who, under Osman and his successors, exercised this mighty but devastating influence in the world. 
we must realize that the basic fact underlying the Turkish mentality is its utter contempt for all other races. A fairly insane pride is the element that largely explains this strange human species. The common term applied by the Turk to the Christian is dog, and in his estimation this is no mere rhetorical figure. He actually looks upon his European neighbors as far less worthy of consideration than his own domestic animals. My son, an old Turk once said, do you see that herd of swine? Some are white, some are black, some are large, some are small. They differ from each other in some respects, but they are all swine. So it is with Christians. Be not deceived, my son. These Christians may wear fine clothes, their women may be very beautiful to look upon, their skins are white and splendid, many of them are very intelligent, and they build wonderful cities and create what seem to be great states. But remember that underneath all this dazzling exterior they are all the same, they are all swine. Practically all foreigners while in the presence of a Turk, are conscious of this attitude. The Turk may be obsequiously polite, but there is invariably an almost unconscious feeling that he is mentally shrinking from his Christian friend as something unclean. And this fundamental conviction for centuries directed the Ottoman policy towards its subject peoples. This wild horde swept from the plains of Central Asia, and, like a whirlwind, overwhelmed the nations of Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. It conquered Egypt, Arabia, and practically all of northern Africa, and then poured into Europe, crushed the Balkan nations, occupied a large part of Hungary, and even established the outposts of the Ottoman Empire in the southern part of Russia. So far as I can discover, the Ottoman Turks had only one great quality, that of military genius. They had several military leaders of commanding ability, and the early conquering Turks were brave, fanatical, and tenacious fighters, just as their descendants are today. I think that these old Turks present the most complete illustration in history of the brigand idea in politics. They were lacking in what we may call the fundamentals of a civilized community. They had no alphabet and no art of writing no books, no poets, no art, and no architecture. They built no cities, and they established no lasting state. They knew no law except the rule of might, and they had practically no agriculture and no industrial organization. They were simply wild and marauding horsemen, whose one conception of tribal success was to pounce upon people who were more civilized than themselves and plunder them. In the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries these tribes overran the cradles of modern civilization, which have given Europe its religion and, to a large extent, its civilization. At that time these territories were the seats of many peaceful and prosperous nations. The Mesopotamian valley supported a large, industrious, agricultural population. Baghdad was one of the largest and most flourishing cities in existence. Constantinople had a greater population than Rome, and the Balkan region and Asia Minor contained several powerful states. Over all this part of the world the Turk now swept as a huge destructive force. Mesopotamia in a few years became a desert, the great cities of the Near East were reduced to misery, and the subject peoples became slaves. Such graces of civilization as the Turk has acquired in five centuries have practically all been taken from the subject peoples whom he so greatly despises. His religion comes from the Arabs, his language has acquired a certain literary value by borrowing certain Arabic and Persian elements, and his writing is Arabic. Constantinople's finest architectural monument, the Mosque of St. Sophia, was originally a Christian church, and all so-called Turkish architecture is derived from the Byzantine. The mechanism of business and industry has always rested in the hands of the subject peoples, Greek, Jews, Armenians, and Arabs. 
the turks have learned little of european art or science they have established very few educational institutions and illiteracy is the prevailing rule the result is that poverty has attained a degree of sordidness and misery in the ottoman empire which is almost unparalleled elsewhere the turkish peasant lives in a mud hut he sleeps on a dirt floor he has no chairs no tables no eating utensils no clothes except the few scant garments which cover his back and which he usually wears for many years in the course of time these turks might learn certain things from their european and arab neighbors but there was one idea which they could never even faintly grasp they could not understand that a conquered people were anything except slaves when they took possession of a land they found it occupied by a certain number of camels horses buffaloes dogs swine and human beings of all these living things the object that physically most resembled themselves they regarded as the least important it became a common saying with them that a horse or a camel was far more valuable than a man these animals cost money whereas infidel christians were plentiful in the ottoman countries and could easily be forced into labor it is true that the early sultans gave the subject peoples and the europeans in the empire certain rights but these in themselves really reflected the contempt in which all non-Muslims were held. I have already described the capitulations under which foreigners in Turkey had their own courts, prisons, post-offices, and other institutions. Yet the early sultans gave these privileges not from a spirit of tolerance, but merely because they looked upon the Christian nations as unclean, and therefore unfit to have any contact with the Ottoman administrative and judicial system. The sultans similarly erected the several peoples, such as the Greeks and the Armenians, into separate millets, or nations, not because they desired to promote their independence and welfare, but because they regarded them as vermin, and therefore disqualified for membership in the Ottoman state. The attitude of the government toward their Christian subjects was illustrated by certain regulations which limited their freedom of action. The buildings in which Christians lived could not be conspicuous, and their churches should have no belfry. Christians could not ride a horse in the city, for that was the exclusive right of the noble Muslim. The Turk had the right to test the sharpness of his sword upon the neck of any Christian. Imagine a great government year in and year out maintaining this attitude toward many millions of its own subjects, and for centuries the Turks simply lived like parasites upon these overburdened and industrious people. They taxed them into economic extinction, stole their most beautiful daughters and forced them into their harems, took Christian male infants by the hundreds of thousands and brought them up as Muslim soldiers. I have no intention of describing the terrible vassalage and oppression that went on for five centuries. My purpose is merely to emphasize this innate attitude of the Muslim Turk to people not of his own race and religion, that they are not human beings with rights, but merely chattels, which may be permitted to live when they promote the interest of their masters, but which may be pitilessly destroyed when they have ceased to be useful. This attitude is intensified by a total disregard for human life and an intense delight in inflicting physical human suffering, which are not unusually the qualities of primitive peoples. Such were the mental characteristics of the Turk in his days of military greatness. In recent times his attitude toward foreigners and his subject peoples had superficially changed. His own military decline and the ease with which the infidel nations defeated his finest armies had apparently given the haughty descendants of Osman a respect at least for their prowess. The rapid disappearance of his own empire in a hundred years, the creation out of the Ottoman Empire of new states like Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, and Romania, and the wonderful improvement which had followed the destruction of the Turkish yoke in these benighted lands, may have increased the Ottoman hatred for the unbeliever, but at least they had a certain influence in opening his eyes to his importance. 
Many Turks also now received their education in European universities. They studied in their professional schools, and they became physicians, surgeons, lawyers, engineers, and chemists of the modern kind. However much the more progressive Muslims might despise their Christian associates, they could not ignore the fact that the finest things, in this temporal world at least, were the products of European and American civilization. And now that one development of modern history which seemed to be the least understandable to the Turk began to force itself upon the consciousness of the more intelligent and progressive. Certain leaders arose who began to speak surreptitiously of such things as constitutionalism, liberty, self-government, and to whom the Declaration of Independence contained certain truths that might have a value even for Islam. These daring spirits began to dream of overturning the autocratic sultan and of substituting a parliamentary system for his irresponsible rule. I have already described the rise and fall of this young Turk movement under such leaders as Talat, Enver, Jemal, and their associates in the Committee of Union and Progress. The point which I am emphasizing here is that this movement presupposed a complete transformation of Turkish mentality, especially in its attitude toward subject peoples. No longer, under the reformed Turkish state, were Greeks, Syrians, Armenians, and Jews to be regarded as filthy djaurs. All these peoples were henceforth to have equal rights and equal duties. A general love feast now followed the establishment of the new regime, and scenes of almost frenzied reconciliation, in which Turks and Armenians embraced each other publicly, apparently signalized the absolute union of the long antagonistic peoples. The Turkish leaders, including Talat and Enver, visited Christian churches and sent forth prayers of thanksgiving for the new order, and went to Armenian cemeteries to shed tears of retribution over the bones of the martyred Armenians who lay there. Armenian priests reciprocally paid their tributes to the Turks in Mohammedan mosques. Enver Pasha visited several Armenian schools, telling the children that the old days of Muslim-Christian strife had passed forever, and that the two peoples were now to live together as brothers and sisters. There were cynics who smiled at all these demonstrations, and yet one development encouraged even them to believe that an earthly paradise had arrived. All through the period of domination only the master Muslim had been permitted to bear arms and serve in the Ottoman army. To be a soldier was an occupation altogether too manly and glorious for the despised Christian. But now the young Turks encouraged all Christians to arm, and enrolled them in the army on an equality with the Muslims. These Christians fought, both as officers and soldiers, in the Italian and Balkan wars, winning high praise from the Turkish generals for their valor and skill. Armenian leaders had figured conspicuously in the young Turk movement. These men apparently believed that a constitutional Turkey was possible. They were conscious of their own intellectual and industrial superiority to the Turks, and knew that they could prosper in the Ottoman Empire if left alone, whereas, under European control, they would have greater difficulty in meeting the competition of the more rigorous European colonists who might come in. With the deposition of the Red Sultan, Abdul Hamid, and the establishment of a constitutional system, the Armenians now, for the first time in several centuries, felt themselves to be free men. But, as I have already described, all these aspirations vanished like a dream. Long before the European war began, the Turkish democracy had disappeared. The power of the new sultan had gone, and the hopes of regenerating Turkey on modern lines had gone also, leaving only a group of individuals headed by Talat and Enver actually in possession of the state. Having lost their democratic aspirations, these men now supplanted them with a new national conception. In place of a democratic constitutional state, they resurrected the idea of pan-Turkism. In place of equal treatment of all Ottomans, 
they decided to establish a country exclusively for Turks. I have called this a new conception, yet it was only new to the individuals who then controlled the destiny of the empire, for in reality it was simply an attempt to revive the most barbaric ideas of their ancestors. It represented, as I have said, merely an atavistic reversion to the original Turk. We now saw that the Turkish leaders, in talking about liberty, equality, fraternity, and constitutionalism, were merely children repeating phrases, that they had used the word democracy merely as a ladder by which to climb to power. After five hundred years' close contact with European civilization, the Turk remained precisely the same individual as one who had emerged from the steppes of Asia in the Middle Ages. He was clinging just as tenaciously as his ancestors to that conception of a state as consisting of a few master individuals whose right it is to enslave and plunder and maltreat any peoples whom they can subject to their military control. Though Talat and Enver and Jamal all came of the humblest families, the same fundamental ideas of master and slave possessed them that formed the statecraft of Osman and the early sultans. We now discovered that a paper constitution, and even tearful visits to Christian churches and cemeteries, could not uproot the inborn preconception of this nomadic tribe that there are only two kinds of people in the world, the conquering and the conquered. When the Turkish government abrogated the capitulations, and in this way freed themselves from the domination of the foreign powers, they were merely taking one step toward realizing this pan-Turkish ideal. I have alluded to difficulties which I had with them over the Christian schools. Their determination to uproot these, or at least to transform them into Turkish institutions, was merely another detail in the same racial progress. Similarly, they attempted to make all foreign business houses employ only Turkish labor, insisting that they should discharge their Greek, Armenian, and Jewish clerks, stenographers, workmen, and all other employees. They ordered all foreign houses to keep their books in Turkish. They wanted to furnish employment for Turks, and enable them to acquire modern business methods. The Ottoman government even refused to have any dealings with the representative of the largest Austrian munition-maker unless he admitted a Turk as a partner. They developed a mania for suppressing all languages except Turkish. For decades French had been the accepted language of foreigners in Constantinople. Most street signs were printed in both French and Turkish. One morning the astonished foreign residents discovered that all these French signs had been removed, and that the names of the streets, the directions on street cars, and other public notices appeared only in those strange Turkish characters which very few of them understood. Great confusion resulted from this change, but the ruling powers refused to restore the detested foreign language. These leaders not only reverted to the barbaric conceptions of their ancestors, but they went to extremes that had never entered the minds of the early sultans. Their fifteenth and sixteenth century predecessors treated the subject peoples as dirt under their feet, yet they believed that they had a certain usefulness, and did not disdain to make them their slaves. But this committee of union and progress, led by Talat and Enver, now decided to do away with them altogether. The old conquering Turks had made the Christians their servants, but their parvenu descendants bettered their instruction, for they determined to exterminate them wholesale and Turkify the empire by massacring the non-Muslim elements. Originally this was not the statesmanlike conception of Talat and Enver. The man who first devised it was one of the greatest monsters known to history, the Red Sultan, Abdul Hamid. This man came to the throne in 1876 at a critical period in Turkish history. In the first two years of his reign, he lost Bulgaria as well as important provinces in the Caucasus, his last remaining vestiges of sovereignty in Montenegro, Serbia, and Romania, and all his real powers in Bosnia and Herzegovina.
Greece had long since become an independent nation, and the processes that were to wrench Egypt from the Ottoman Empire had already begun. As the Sultan took stock of his inheritance, he could easily foresee the day when all the rest of his domain would pass into the hand of the infidel. What had caused this disintegration of this extensive Turkish empire? The real cause, of course, lay deep in the character of the Turk, but Abdul Hamid saw only the more obvious fact that the intervention of the great European powers had brought relief to these imprisoned nations. Of all the new kingdoms which had been carved out of the Sultan's dominions, Serbia, let us remember this fact to her everlasting honor, is the only one that has won her own independence. Russia, France, and Great Britain have set free all the rest. And what had happened several times before might happen again. There still remained one compact race in the Ottoman Empire that had national aspirations and national potentialities. In the northeastern part of Asia Minor, bordering on Russia, there were six provinces in which the Armenians formed the largest element in the population. From the time of Herodotus, this portion of Asia has borne the name of Armenia. The Armenians of the present day are the direct descendants of the people who inhabited the country three thousand years ago. Their origin is so ancient that it is lost in fable and mystery. There are still undeciphered cuneiform inscriptions on the rocky hills of Van, the largest Armenian city, that have led certain scholars, though not many, I must admit, to identify the Armenian races with the Hittites of the Bible. What is definitely known about the Armenians, however, is that for ages they have constituted the most civilized and most industrious race in the eastern section of the Ottoman Empire. From their mountains they have spread over the Sultan's dominions, and form a considerable element in the population of all the large cities. Everywhere they are known for their industry, their intelligence, and their decent and orderly lives. They are so superior to the Turks intellectually and morally that much of the business and industry had passed into their hands. With the Greeks, the Armenians constitute the economic strength of the empire. These people became Christians in the fourth century, and established the Armenian church as their state religion. This is said to be the oldest Christian church in existence. In the face of persecutions which have had no parallel elsewhere, these people have clung to their early Christian faith with the utmost tenacity. For fifteen hundred years they have lived there in Armenia, a little island of Christians surrounded by backward peoples of hostile religion and hostile race. Their long existence has been one unending martyrdom. The territory which they inhabit forms the connecting link between Europe and Asia, and all the Asiatic invasions. Saracens, Tartars, Mongols, Kurds, and Turks have passed over their peaceful country. For centuries they have thus been the Belgium of the East. Through all this period the Armenians have regarded themselves not as Asiatics, but as Europeans. They speak an Indo-European language, their racial origin is believed by scholars to be Aryan, and the fact that their religion is the religion of Europe has always made them turn their eyes westward. And out of that western country they have always hoped would some day come the deliverance that would rescue them from their murderous masters. And now, as Abdul Hamid, in 1876, surveyed his shattered domain, he saw that its most dangerous spot was Armenia. He believed, rightly or wrongly, that these Armenians, like the Romanians, the Bulgarians, the Greeks, and the Serbians, aspired to restore their independent medieval nation, and he knew that Europe and America sympathized with his ambition. The Treaty of Berlin, which had definitely ended the Turco-Russian War, contained an article which gave the European powers a protecting hand over the Armenians. How could the Sultan free himself permanently from this danger? An enlightened administration, which would have transformed the Armenians into free men, and made them safe in their lives and property, and civil and religious rights, 
would probably have made them peaceful and loyal subjects. But the Sultan could not rise to such a conception of statesmanship as this. Instead, Abdul Hamid apparently thought that there was only one way of ridding Turkey of the Armenian problem, and that was to rid her of the Armenians. The physical destruction of two million men, women, and children by massacres, organized and directed by the state, seemed to be the one sure way of forestalling the further disruption of the Turkish Empire. And now for nearly thirty years Turkey gave the world an illustration of government by massacre. We in Europe and America heard of these events when they reached especially monstrous proportions, as they did in 1895 and 1896, when nearly 200,000 Armenians were most atrociously done to death. But through all these years the existence of the Armenians was one continuous nightmare. Their property was stolen, their men were murdered, their women were ravished, their young girls were kidnapped and forced to live in Turkish harems. Yet Abdul Hamid was not able to accomplish his full purpose. Had he had his will, he would have massacred the whole nation in one hideous orgy. He attempted to exterminate the Armenians in 1895 and 1896, but found certain insuperable obstructions to his scheme. Chief of these were England, France, and Russia. These atrocities called Gladstone, then eighty-six years old, from his retirement, and his speeches, in which he denounced the Sultan as the great assassin, aroused the whole world to the enormities that were taking place. It became apparent that, unless the Sultan desisted, England, France, and Russia would intervene, and the Sultan well knew that, in case this intervention took place, such remnants of Turkey as had survived earlier partitions would disappear. Thus Abdul Hamid had to abandon his satanic enterprise of destroying a whole race by murder, yet Armenia continued to suffer the slow agony of pitiless persecution. Up to the outbreak of the European war not a day had passed in the Armenian vilayets without its outrages and its murders. The young Turk regime, despite its promises of universal brotherhood, brought no respite to the Armenians. A few months after the love-feastings already described, one of the worst massacres took place at Adana, in which thirty-five thousand people were destroyed. And now the young Turks, who had adopted so many of Abdul Hamid's ideas, also made his Armenian policy their own. Their passion for Turkifying the nation seemed to demand logically the extermination of all Christians, Greeks, Syrians, and Armenians. Much as they admired the Mohammedan conquerors of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, they stupidly believed that these great warriors had made one fatal mistake for they had had it in their power completely to obliterate the Christian populations, and had neglected to do so. This policy, in their opinion, was a fatal error of statesmanship, and explained all the woes from which Turkey has suffered in modern times. Had these old Muslim chieftains, when they conquered Bulgaria, put all the Bulgarians to the sword, and peopled the Bulgarian country with Muslim Turks, there would never have been any modern Bulgarian problem, and Turkey would never have lost this part of her empire. Similarly, had they destroyed all the Romanians, Serbians, and Greeks, the provinces which are now occupied by these races would still have remained integral parts of the Sultan's domain. They felt that the mistake had been a terrible one, but that something might be saved from the ruin. They would destroy all Greeks, Syrians, Armenians, and other Christians, move Muslim families into their homes and into their farms, and so make sure that these territories would not similarly be taken away from Turkey. In order to accomplish this great reform, it would not be necessary to murder every living Christian. The most beautiful and healthy Armenian girls could be taken, converted forcibly to Mohammedanism, and made the wives or concubines of devout followers of the Prophet. Their children would then automatically become Muslims, and so strengthen the empire, as the Janissaries had strengthened it formerly. These Armenian girls represent a high type of womanhood, and the young Turks, in their crude, intuitive way, 
recognized that the mingling of their blood with the Turkish population would exert a eugenic influence upon the whole. Armenian boys of tender years could be taken into Turkish families and be brought up in ignorance of the fact that they were anything but Muslims. These were about the only elements, however, that could make any valuable contributions to the new Turkey which was now being planned. Since all precautions must be taken against the development of a new generation of Armenians, it would be necessary to kill outright all men who were in their prime, and thus capable of propagating the accursed species. Old men and women formed no great danger to the future of Turkey, for they had already fulfilled their natural function of leaving descendants. Still, they were nuisances, and therefore should be disposed of. Unlike Abdul Hamid, the young Turks found themselves in a position where they could carry out this holy enterprise. Great Britain, France, and Russia had stood in the way of their predecessor, but now these obstacles had been removed. The young Turks, as I have said, believed that they had defeated these nations, and that they could therefore no longer interfere with their internal affairs. Only one power could successfully raise objections, and that was Germany. In 1898, when all the rest of Europe was ringing with Gladstone's denunciations and demanding intervention, Kaiser Wilhelm II had gone to Constantinople, visited Abdul Hamid, pinned his finest decorations on that bloody tyrant's breast, and kissed him on both cheeks. The same Kaiser who had done this in 1898 was still sitting on the throne in 1915, and was now Turkey's ally. Thus, for the first time in two centuries, the Turks, in 1915, had their Christian populations utterly at their mercy. The time had finally come to make Turkey exclusively the country of the Turks. End of chapter 22《ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレターズ・ラブレター and one of the richest in historical associations. The city of Van, which is the capital of the Vilayet, lies on the eastern shores of the lake of the same name. It is the one large town in Asia Minor in which the Armenian population is larger than the Muslim. In the fall of 1914, its population of about 30,000 people represented one of the most peaceful and happy and prosperous communities in the Turkish Empire. Though Van, like practically every other section where Armenians lived, had had its periods of oppression and massacre, yet the Muslim yoke, comparatively speaking, rested upon its people rather lightly. Its Turkish governor, Tasin Pasha, was one of the more enlightened type of Turkish officials. Relations between the Armenians, who lived in the better section of the city, and the Turks and the Kurds, who occupied the mud huts in the Muslim quarter, had been tolerably agreeable for many years. The location of this vilayet, however, inevitably made it the scene of military operations, and made the activities of its Armenian population a matter of daily suspicion. Should Russia attempt an invasion of Turkey, one of the most accessible routes lay through this province. The war had not gone far when causes of irritation arose. The requisitions of army supplies fell far more heavily upon the Christian than upon the Mohammedan elements in Van, just as they did in every other part of Turkey. The Armenians had to stand quietly by while the Turkish officers appropriated all their cattle, all their wheat, and all their goods of every kind, giving them only worthless pieces of paper in exchange. The attempt at general disarmament that took place also aroused their apprehension, 
which was increased by the brutal treatment visited upon Armenian soldiers in the Caucasus. On the other hand, the Turks made many charges against the Christian population, and, in fact, they attributed to them the larger share of the blame for the reverses which the Turkish armies had suffered in the Caucasus. The fact that a considerable element in the already changed forces was composed of Armenians aroused their unbridled wrath. Since about half the Armenians in the world inhabit the Russian provinces in the Caucasus, and are liable, like all Russians, to military service, there were certainly no legitimate grounds for complaint, so far as these Armenian levies were bona fide subjects of the Tsar. But the Turks asserted that a large number of Armenian soldiers in Van and other of their Armenian provinces deserted, crossed the border, and joined the Russian army, where their knowledge of roads and the terrain was an important factor in the Russian victories. Though the exact facts are not yet ascertained, it seems not unlikely that such desertions, perhaps a few hundred, did take place. At the beginning of the war, Union and Progress agents appeared in Erzerum and Van, and appealed to the Armenian leaders to go into Russian Armenia and attempt to start revolutions against the Russian government. And the fact that the Ottoman Armenians refused to do this contributed further to the prevailing irritation. The Turkish government has made much of the treasonable behavior of the Armenians of Van, and have even urged it as an excuse for their subsequent treatment of the whole race. Their attitude illustrates once more the perversity of the Turkish mind. After massacring hundreds of thousands of Armenians in the course of thirty years, outraging their women and girls, and robbing and maltreating them in every conceivable way, the Turks still apparently believed that they had the right to expect from them the most enthusiastic loyalty that the Armenians all over Turkey sympathized with the Entente was no secret. If you want to know how the war is going, wrote a humorous Turkish newspaper, all you need to do is look in the face of an Armenian. If he is smiling, then the Allies are winning. If he is downcast, then the Germans are successful. If an Ottoman Armenian soldier should desert and join the Russians, that would unquestionably constitute a technical crime against the state, and might be punished without violating the rules of all civilized countries. Only the Turkish mind, however, and possibly the Junker, could regard it as furnishing an excuse for the terrible barbarities that now took place. Though the air, all through the Ottoman winter of 1914 and 1915, was filled with premonitions of trouble, the Armenians behaved with remarkable self-restraint. For years it had been the Turkish policy to provoke the Christian population into committing overt acts, and then seizing upon such misbehavior as an excuse for massacres. The Armenian clergy and political leaders saw many evidences that the Turks were now up to their old tactics, and they therefore went among the people, cautioning them to keep quiet, to bear all insults and even outrages patiently, so as not to give the Muslims the opening which they were seeking. Even though they burn a few of our villages, these leaders would say, do not retaliate, for it is better that a few be destroyed than that the whole nation be massacred. When the war started, the central government called Tassin Pasha, the conciliatory governor of Van, and replaced him with Djevdet Bey, a brother-in-law of Enver Pasha. This act in itself was most disquieting. Turkish officialdom has always contained a minority of men who do not believe in massacre as a state policy, and cannot be depended upon to carry out strictly the most bloody orders of the central government. Whenever massacres have been planned, therefore, it has been customary first to remove such untrustworthy public servants, and replace them by men who are regarded as more reliable. The character of Tassin's successor made his displacement still more alarming. Djevdet had spent the larger part of his life at Van. He was a man of unstable character, friendly to non-Muslims one moment, hostile the next, and 
hypocritical, treacherous, and ferocious according to the worst traditions of his race. He hated the Armenians, and cordially sympathized with the long-established Turkish plan of solving the Armenian problem. There is little question that he came to Van with definite instructions to exterminate all Armenians in this province, but for the first few months conditions did not facilitate such operations. Dievdet himself was absent fighting the Russians in the Caucasus, and the near approach of the enemy made it a wise policy for the Turks to refrain from maltreating the Armenians of Van. But early in the spring the Russians temporarily retreated. It is generally recognized as good military tactics for a victorious army to follow up the retreating enemy. In the eyes of the Turkish generals, however, the withdrawal of the Russians was a happy turn of war, mainly because it deprived the Armenians of their protectors, and left them at the mercies of the Turkish army. Instead of following the retreating foe, therefore, the Turks' army turned aside and invaded their own territory of Van. Instead of fighting the trained Russian army of men, they turned their rifles, machine-guns, and other weapons upon the Armenian women, children, and old men in the villages of Van. Following their usual custom, they distributed the most beautiful Armenian women among the Muslims, sacked and burned the Armenian villages, and massacred uninterruptedly for days. On April 15th, about five hundred young Armenian men of Akans were mustered to hear an order of the Sultan. At sunset they were marched outside the town, and every man shot in cold blood. This procedure was repeated in about eighty Armenian villages in the district north of Lake Van, and in three days twenty-four thousand Armenians were murdered in this atrocious fashion. A single episode illustrates the unspeakable depravity of Turkish methods. A conflict having broken out at Shadak, Jevdet Bey, who had meanwhile returned to Van, asked four of the leading Armenian citizens to go to this town and attempt to quiet the multitude. These men made the trip, stopping at all Armenian villages along the way, urging everybody to keep public order. After completing their work, these four Armenians were murdered in a Kurdish village. And so when Djevdet Bey, on his return to his official post, demanded that Van furnish him immediately four thousand soldiers, the people were naturally in no mood to accede to his request. When we consider what had happened before, and what happened subsequently, there remains little doubt concerning the purpose which underlay this demand. Djevdet, acting in obedience to orders from Constantinople, was preparing to wipe out the whole population, and his purpose in calling for four thousand able-bodied men was merely to massacre them, so that the rest of the Armenians might have no defenders. The Armenians, parleying to gain time, offered to furnish five hundred soldiers, and to pay exemption money for the rest. Now, however, Djevdet began to talk aloud about rebellion, and his determination to crush it at any cost. If the rebels fire a single shot, he declared, I shall kill every Christian man, woman, and, pointing to his knee, every child up to here. For some time the Turks had been constructing entrenchments around the Armenian quarter, and filling them with soldiers, and, in response to this provocation, the Armenians began to make preparations for a defense. On April 20th a band of Turkish soldiers seized several Armenian women who were entering the city. A couple of Armenians ran to their assistance, and were shot dead. The Turks now opened fire on the Armenian quarters with rifles and artillery. Soon a large part of the town was in flames, and a regular siege had started. The whole Armenian fighting force consisted of only 1,500 men. They had only 300 rifles, and a most inadequate supply of ammunition, while Djevdet had an army of 5,000 men, completely equipped and supplied. Yet the Armenians fought with the utmost heroism and skill. They had little chance of holding off their enemies indefinitely, 
but they knew that a Russian army was fighting its way to Van, and their utmost hope was that they would be able to defy the besiegers until these Russians arrived. As I am not writing the story of sieges and battles, I cannot describe in detail the numerous acts of individual heroism, the cooperation of the Armenian women, the ardor and energy of the Armenian children, the self-sacrificing zeal of the American missionaries, especially Dr. Usher and his wife, and Miss Grace H. Knapp, and the thousand other circumstances that made this terrible month one of the most glorious pages in modern Armenian history. The wonderful thing about it is that the Armenians triumphed. After nearly five weeks of sleepless fighting, the Russian army suddenly appeared, and the Turks fled into the surrounding country, where they found appeasement for their anger by further massacres of unprotected Armenian villagers. Dr. Usher, the American medical missionary whose hospital at Van was destroyed by bombardment, is authority for the statement that, after driving off the Turks, the Russians began to collect and to cremate the bodies of Armenians who had been murdered in the province, with the result that fifty-five thousand bodies were burned. I have told this story of the revolution in Van, not only because it marked the first stage in this organized attempt to wipe out a whole nation, but because these events are always brought forward by the Turks as a justification of their subsequent crimes. As I shall relate, Enver, Talat, and the rest, when I appealed to them in behalf of the Armenians, invariably instanced the revolutionists of Van as a sample of Armenian treachery. The famous revolution, as this recital shows, was merely the determination of the Armenians to save their women's honor and their own lives, after the Turks, by massacring thousands of their neighbors, had shown them the fate that awaited them. End of chapter 23《ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッタイムズ・ブラッドリー・ハッ The Armenian men had possessed little power or means of resistance. In those days, Armenians had not been permitted to have military training, to serve in the Turkish army, or to possess arms. As I have already said, these discriminations were withdrawn when the revolutionists obtained the upper hand in 1908. Not only were the Christians now permitted to bear arms, but the authorities, In the full flush of their enthusiasm for freedom and equality, encouraged them to do so. In the early part of 1915, therefore, every Turkish city contained thousands of Armenians who had been trained as soldiers and who were supplied with rifles, pistols, and other weapons of defense. The operations at Van once more disclosed that these men could use their weapons to good advantage. It was thus apparent that an Armenian massacre this time would generally assume more the character of warfare than those wholesale butcheries of defenseless men and women which the Turks had always found so congenial. If this plan of murdering a race were to succeed, two preliminary steps would therefore have to be taken. It would be necessary to render all Armenian soldiers powerless and to deprive of their arms the Armenians in every city and town. Before Armenia could be slaughtered, Armenia must be made defenseless. In the early part of 1915, the Armenian soldiers in the Turkish army were reduced to a new status. Up to that time, most of them had been combatants, but now they were all stripped of their arms and transformed into workmen. Instead of serving their country as artillerymen and cavalrymen, these former soldiers now discovered that they had been transformed into road laborers and pack animals. Army supplies of all kinds were loaded on their backs, 
and stumbling under the burdens and driven by the whips and bayonets of the Turks, they were forced to drag their weary bodies into the mountains of the Caucasus. Sometimes they would have to plough their way, burdened in this fashion, almost waist-high through snow. They had to spend practically all their time in the open, sleeping on the bare ground, whenever the ceaseless prodding of their taskmasters gave them an occasional opportunity to sleep. They were given only scraps of food. If they fell sick, they were left where they had dropped, their Turkish oppressors perhaps stopping long enough to rob them of all their possessions, even of their clothes. If any stragglers succeeded in reaching their destinations, they were not infrequently massacred. In many instances, Armenian soldiers were disposed of in even more summary fashion, for it had now become almost the general practice to shoot them in cold blood. In almost all cases, the procedure was the same. Here and there, squads of fifty or a hundred men would be taken, bound together in groups of four, and then marched out to a secluded spot a short distance from the village. Suddenly the sound of rifle-shots would fill the air, and the Turkish soldiers who had acted as the escort would sullenly return to camp. Those sent to bury the bodies would find them almost invariably stark naked, for, as usual, the Turks had stolen all their clothes. In cases that came to my attention, the murderers had added a refinement to their victims' sufferings by compelling them to dig their graves before being shot. Let me relate a single episode which is contained in one of the reports of our consuls, and which now forms a part of the records of the American State Department. Early in July, two thousand Armenian Amelés, such is the Turkish word for soldiers who have been reduced to workmen, were sent from Harput to build roads. The Armenians in that town understood what this meant, and pleaded with the governor for mercy but this official insisted that the men were not to be harmed, and he even called upon the German missionary, Mr. Eamon, to quiet the panic, giving that gentleman his word of honour that the ex-soldiers would be protected. Mr. Eamon believed the governor and assuaged the popular fear. Yet practically every man of these two thousand was massacred, and his body thrown into a cave. A few escaped, and it was from these that news of the massacre reached the world. A few days afterward another two thousand soldiers were sent to Diyarbakir. The only purpose of sending these men out in the open country was that they might be massacred. In order that they might have no strength to resist or escape by flight, these poor creatures were systematically starved. Government agents went ahead on the road, notifying the Kurds that the caravan was approaching, and ordering them to do their congenial duty. Not only did the Kurdish tribesmen pour down from the mountains upon this starved and weakened regiment, but the Kurdish women came with butcher's knives in order that they might gain that merit in Allah's eyes that comes from killing a Christian. These massacres were not isolated happenings. I could detail many more episodes just as horrible as the one related above. Throughout the Turkish Empire a systematic attempt was made to kill all able-bodied men, not only for the purpose of removing all males who might propagate a new generation of Armenians, but for the purpose of rendering the weaker part of the population an easy prey. Dreadful as were these massacres of unarmed soldiers, they were mercy and justice themselves when compared with the treatment which was now visited upon those Armenians who were suspected of concealing arms. Naturally the Christians became alarmed when placards were posted in the villages and cities ordering everybody to bring their arms to headquarters. Although this order applied to all citizens, the Armenians well understood what the result would be should they be left defenseless while their Muslim neighbors were permitted to retain their arms. In many cases, however, the persecuted people patiently obeyed the command, and then the Turkish officials almost joyfully seized their rifles as evidence that a revolution was being planned, and threw their victims into prison on a charge of treason. Thousands failed to deliver arms 
simply because they had none to deliver, while an even greater number tenaciously refused to give them up, not because they were plotting an uprising, but because they proposed to defend their own lives and their women's honor against the outrages which they knew were being planned. The punishment inflicted upon these recalcitrants forms one of the most hideous chapters of modern history. Most of us believe that torture has long ceased to be an administrative and judicial measure, yet I do not believe that the darkest ages ever presented scenes more horrible than those which now took place all over Turkey. Nothing was sacred to the Turkish gendarmes. Under the plea of searching for hidden arms, they ransacked churches, treated the altars and sacred utensils with the utmost indignity, and even held mock ceremonies in imitation of the Christian sacraments. They would beat the priests into insensibility, under the pretense that they were the centers of sedition. When they could discover no weapons in the churches, they would sometimes arm the bishops and priests with guns, pistols, and swords, and then try them before courts martial for possessing weapons against the law, and march them in this condition through the streets, merely to arouse the fanatical wrath of the mobs. The gendarmes treated women with the same cruelty and indecency as the men. There are cases on record in which women accused of concealing weapons were stripped naked and whipped with branches freshly cut from trees, and these beatings were even inflicted on women who were with child. Violations so commonly accompanied these searches that Armenian women and girls on the approach of the gendarmes would flee to the woods, the hills, or to mountain eaves. As a preliminary to the searches everywhere, the strong men of the villages and towns were arrested and taken to prison. Their tormentors here would exercise the most diabolical ingenuity in their attempt to make their victims declare themselves to be revolutionists, and to tell the hiding-places of their arms. A common practice was to place the prisoner in a room, with two Turks stationed at each end and each side. The examination would then begin with the bastinado. This is a form of torture not uncommon in the Orient. It consists of beating the soles of the feet with a thin rod. At first the pain is not marked, but as the process goes slowly on, it develops into the most terrible agony. The feet swell and burst, and, not infrequently, after being submitted to this treatment, they have to be amputated. The gendarmes would bastinado their Armenian victim until he fainted. They would then revive him by sprinkling water on his face, and begin again. If this did not succeed in bringing their victim to terms, they had numerous other methods of persuasion. They would pull out his eyebrows and beard almost hair by hair. They would extract his fingernails and toenails. They would apply red-hot irons to his breast tear off his flesh with red-hot pincers, and then pour boiled butter into the wounds. In some cases the gendarmes would nail hands and feet to pieces of wood, evidently in imitation of the crucifixion, and then, while the sufferer writhed in his agony, they would cry, Now let your Christ come help you. These cruelties, and many others which I forbear to describe, were usually inflicted in the night-time. Turks would be stationed around the prisons, beating drums and blowing whistles, so that the screams of the sufferers would not reach the villagers. In thousands of cases the Armenians endured these agonies, and refused to surrender their arms, simply because they had none to surrender. However, they could not persuade their tormentors that this was the case. It therefore became customary, when news was received that the searchers were approaching, for Armenians to purchase arms from their Turkish neighbors so that they might be able to give them up and escape these frightful punishments. One day I was discussing these proceedings with a responsible Turkish official who was describing the tortures inflicted. He made no secret of the fact that the government had instigated them, and, like all Turks of the official classes, he enthusiastically approved this treatment of the detested race. 
This official told me that all these details were matters of nightly discussion at the headquarters of the Union and Progress Committee. Each new method of inflicting pain was hailed as a splendid discovery, and the regular attendants were constantly ransacking their brains in the effort to devise some new torment. He told me that they even delved into the records of the Spanish Inquisition and other historic institutions of torture, and adopted all the suggestions found there. He did not tell me who carried off the prize in this gruesome competition, but common reputation throughout Armenia gave a preeminent infamy to Djevdet Bey, the valley of Van, whose activities in that section I have already described. All through this country, Djevdet was generally known as the horseshoer of Bashkale, for this connoisseur in torture had invented what was perhaps the masterpiece of all, that of nailing horseshoes to the feet of his Armenian victims. Yet these happenings did not constitute what the newspapers of the time commonly referred to as the Armenian atrocities. They were merely the preparatory steps in the destruction of the race. The young Turks displayed greater ingenuity than their predecessor, Abdul Hamid. The injunction of the deposed sultan was merely to kill, kill, whereas the Turkish democracy hit upon an entirely new plan. Instead of massacring outright the Armenian race, they now decided to deport it. In the south and southeastern section of the Ottoman Empire lie the Syrian desert and the Mesopotamian valley. Though part of this area was once the scene of a flourishing civilization, for the last five centuries it has suffered the blight that becomes the lot of any country that is subjected to Turkish rule, and it is now a dreary, desolate waste, without cities and towns or life of any kind, populated only by a few wild and fanatical Bedouin tribes. Only the most industrious labor, expended through many years, could transform this desert into the abiding place of any considerable population. The central government now announced its intention of gathering the two million or more Armenians living in the several sections of the empire, and transporting them to this desolate and inhospitable region. Had they undertaken such a deportation in good faith, it would have represented the height of cruelty and injustice. As a matter of fact, the Turks never had the slightest idea of re-establishing the Armenians in this new country. They knew that the great majority would never reach their destination, and that those who did would either die of thirst and starvation, or be murdered by the wild Mohammedan desert tribes. The real purpose of the deportation was robbery and destruction. It really represented a new method of massacre. When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving the death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and in their conversations with me they made no particular attempt to conceal the fact. All through the spring and summer of 1915 the deportations took place. Of the larger cities, Constantinople, Smyrna, and Aleppo were spared. Practically all other places where a single Armenian family lived now became the scenes of these unspeakable tragedies. Scarcely a single Armenian, whatever his education or wealth, or whatever the social class to which he belonged, was exempted from the order. In some villages placards were posted ordering the whole Armenian population to present itself in a public place at an appointed time, usually a day or two ahead, and in other places the town crier would go through the streets delivering the order vocally. In still others not the slightest warning was given. The gendarmes would appear before an Armenian house and order all the inmates to follow them. They would take the women engaged in their domestic tasks without giving them the chance to change their clothes. The police fell upon them, just as the eruption of Vesuvius fell upon Pompeii. Women were taken from the wash-tubs, children were snatched out of bed, the bread was left half-baked in the oven, the family meal was abandoned, partly eaten, 
the children were taken from the schoolroom, leaving their books open at the daily task, and the men were forced to abandon their ploughs in the fields and their cattle on the mountainside. Even women who had just given birth to children would be forced to leave their beds and join the panic-stricken throng, their sleeping babies in their arms. Such things as they hurriedly snatched up, a shawl, a blanket, perhaps a few scraps of food, were all that they would take of their household belongings. To their frantic questions, where are we going, the gendarmes would vouchsafe only one reply, to the interior. In some cases the refugees were given a few hours, in exceptional instances a few days, to dispose of their property and household effects. But the proceeding, of course, amounted simply to robbery. They could sell only to Turks, and since both buyers and sellers knew that they only had a day or two to market the accumulations of a lifetime, the prices obtained represented a small fraction of their value. Sewing machines would bring one or two dollars, a cow would go for a dollar, a house full of furniture would be sold for a pittance. In many cases Armenians were prohibited from selling, or Turks from buying, even at these ridiculous prices, under pretense that the government intended to sell their effects to pay the creditors whom they would inevitably leave behind, their household furniture would be placed in stores, or heaped up in public places, where it was usually pillaged by Turkish men and women. The government officials would also inform the Armenians that, since their deportation was only temporary, the intention being to bring them back after the war was over, they would not be permitted to sell their houses. Scarcely had the former possessors left the village when Mohammedan Mohajirs, immigrants from other parts of Turkey, would be moved into the Armenian quarters. Similarly, all their valuables, money, rings, watches, and jewelry, would be taken to the police stations for safekeeping, pending their return, and then parceled out among the Turks. Yet these robberies gave the refugees little anguish, for far more terrible and agonizing scenes were taking place under their eyes. The systematic extermination of the men continued. Such males as the persecutions which I have already described had left were now violently dealt with. Before the caravans were started, it became the regular practice to separate the young men from the families tie them together in groups of four, lead them to the outskirts, and shoot them. Public hangings without trial, the only offense being that the victims were Armenians, were taking place constantly. The gendarmes showed a particular desire to annihilate the educated and the influential. From American consuls and missionaries I was constantly receiving reports of such executions, and many of the events which they described will never fade from my memory. At Angora, all Armenian men from fifteen to seventy were arrested, bound together in groups of four, and sent on the road in the direction of Caesarea. When they had travelled five or six hours, and had reached a secluded valley, a mob of Turkish peasants fell upon them with clubs, hammers, axes, scythes, spades, and saws. Such instruments not only caused more agonizing deaths than guns and pistols, but, as the Turks themselves boasted, they were more economical, since they did not involve the waste of powder and shell. In this way they exterminated the whole male population of Angora, including all its men of wealth and breeding, and their bodies, horribly mutilated, were left in the valley where they were devoured by wild beasts. After completing this destruction, the peasants and gendarmes gathered in the local tavern, comparing notes and boasting of the number of jowers that each had slain. In Trebizond the men were placed in boats and sent out on the Black Sea. Gendarmes would follow them in boats, shoot them down, and throw their bodies into the water. When the signal was given for the caravans to move, therefore, they almost invariably consisted of women, children, and old men. Anyone who could possibly have protected them from the fate that awaited them had been destroyed.
not infrequently the prefect of the city, as the mass started on its way, would wish them a derisive, pleasant journey. Before the caravan moved, the women were sometimes offered the alternative of becoming Mohammedans. Even though they accepted the new faith, which few of them did, their earthly troubles did not end. The converts were compelled to surrender their children to a so-called Muslim orphanage, with the agreement that they should be trained as devout followers of the Prophet. They themselves must then show the sincerity of their conversion by abandoning their Christian husbands and marrying Muslims. If no good Mohammedan offered himself as a husband, then the new convert was deported, however strongly she might protest her devotion to Islam. At first the government showed some inclination to protect these departing throngs. The officers usually divided them into convoys, in some cases numbering several hundred, in others several thousand. The civil authorities occasionally furnished ox-carts, which carried such household furniture as the exiles had succeeded in scrambling together. A guard of the gendarmerie accompanied each convoy, ostensibly to guide and protect it. Women, scantily clad, carrying babies in their arms or on their backs, marched side by side with old men hobbling along with canes. Children would run along, evidently regarding the procedure in the early stages as some new lark. A more prosperous member would perhaps have a horse or a donkey. Occasionally a farmer had rescued a cow or a sheep, which would trudge along at his side, and the usual assortment of family pets, dogs, cats, and birds, became parts of the variegated procession. From thousands of Armenian cities and villages these despairing caravans now set forth. They filled all the roads leading southward. Everywhere as they moved on they raised a huge dust and abandoned debris, chairs, blankets, bedclothes, household utensils, and other impediments marked the course of the processions. When the caravans first started, the individuals bore some resemblance to human beings. In a few hours, however, the dust of the road plastered their faces and clothes, the mud caked their lower members, and the slowly advancing mobs, frequently bent with fatigue and crazed by the brutality of their protectors, resembled some new and strange animal species. Yet for the better part of six months, from April to October 1915, practically all the highways in Asia Minor were crowded with these unearthly bands of exiles. They could be seen winding in and out of every valley, and climbing up the sides of nearly every mountain. Moving on and on, they scarcely knew whither, except that every road led to death. Village after village, and town after town was evacuated of its Armenian population under the distressing circumstances already detailed. In these six months, as far as can be ascertained, about one million two hundred thousand people started on this journey to the Syrian desert. Pray for us, they would say as they left their homes, the homes in which their ancestors had lived for two thousand five hundred years. We shall not see you in this world again, but some time we shall meet. Pray for us. The Armenians had hardly left their native villages when the persecutions began. The roads over which they travelled were little more than donkey paths, and what had started a few hours before as an orderly procession soon became a dishevelled and scrambling mob. Women were separated from their children and husbands from their wives. The old people soon lost contact with their families and became exhausted and footsore. The Turkish drivers of the ox-carts, after extorting the last coin from their charges, would suddenly dump them and their belongings into the road, turn around and return to the village for other victims. Thus, in a short time, practically everybody, young and old, was compelled to travel on foot. The gendarmes, whom the government had sent, supposedly to protect the exiles, in a very few hours became their tormentors. 
they followed their charges with fixed bayonets, prodding any one who showed any tendency to slacken the pace. Those who attempted to stop for rest, or who fell exhausted on the road, were compelled, with the utmost brutality, to rejoin the moving throng. They even prodded pregnant women with bayonets. If one, as frequently happened, gave birth along the road, she was immediately forced to get up and rejoin the marchers. The whole course of the journey became a perpetual struggle with the Muslim inhabitants. Detachments of gendarmes would go ahead, notifying the Kurdish tribes that their victims were approaching, and Turkish peasants were also informed that their long-waited opportunity had arrived. The government even opened the prisons and set free the convicts on the understanding that they should behave like good Muslims to the approaching Armenians. Thus every caravan had a continuous battle for existence with several classes of enemies, their accompanying gendarmes, the Turkish peasants and villagers, the Kurdish tribes and bands of chetes or brigands. And we must always keep in mind that the men who might have defended these wayfarers had nearly all been killed or forced into the army as workmen, and that the exiles themselves had been systematically deprived of all weapons before the journey began. When the victims had travelled a few hours from their starting place, the Kurds would sweep down from their mountain homes. Rushing up to the young girls, they would lift their veils and carry the pretty ones off to the hills. They would steal such children as pleased their fancy, and mercilessly rob all the rest of the throng. If the exiles had started with any money or food, their assailants would appropriate it, thus leaving them a hopeless prey to starvation. They would steal their clothing, and sometimes even leave both men and women in a state of complete nudity. All the time that they were committing these depredations, the Kurds would freely massacre, and the screams of women and old men would add to the general horror. Such as escaped these attacks in the open would find new terrors awaiting them in the Muslim villages. Here the Turkish roughs would fall upon the women, leaving them sometimes dead from their experiences, or sometimes ravingly insane. After spending a night in a hideous encampment of this kind, the exiles, or such as had survived, would start again the next morning. The ferocity of the gendarmes apparently increased as the journey lengthened, for they seemed almost to resent the fact that part of their charges continued to live. Frequently any one who dropped on the road was bayoneted on the spot. The Armenians began to die by hundreds from hunger and thirst. Even when they came to rivers, the gendarmes, merely to torment them, would sometimes not let them drink. The hot sun of the desert burned their scantily clothed bodies, and their bare feet, treading the hot sand of the desert, became so sore that thousands fell and died, or were killed where they lay. Thus, in a few days, what had been a procession of normal human beings became a stumbling horde of dust-covered skeletons, ravenously looking for scraps of food, eating any offal that came their way, crazed by the hideous sights that filled every hour of their existence, sick with all the diseases that accompany such hardships and privations, but still prodded on and on by the whips and clubs and bayonets of their executioners. And thus, as the exiles moved, they left behind them another caravan, that of dead and unburied bodies, of old men and of women dying in the last stages of typhus, dysentery, and cholera, of little children lying on their backs and setting up their last piteous wails for food and water. There were women who held up their babies to strangers, begging them to take them and save them from their tormentors, and failing this, they would throw them into wells, or leave them behind bushes, that at least they might die undisturbed. Behind was left a small army of girls who had been sold as slaves, frequently for a medjidi, or about eighty cents, and who, after serving the brutal purposes of their purchasers, were forced to lead lives of prostitution. 
a string of encampments filled by the sick and the dying mingled with the unburied or the half-buried bodies of the dead marked the course of the advancing throngs flocks of vultures followed them in the air and ravenous dogs fighting one another for the bodies of the dead constantly pursued them the most terrible scenes took place at the rivers especially the euphrates sometimes when crossing this stream the gendarmes would push the women into the water shooting all who attempted to save themselves by swimming frequently the women themselves would save their honor by jumping into the river their children in their arms in the last week in june i quote from a consular report several parties of erzurum armenians were deported on successive days and most of them massacred on the way either by shooting or drowning one madame zaruhi an elderly lady of means who was thrown into the euphrates saved herself by clinging to a boulder in the river she succeeded in approaching the bank and returned to erzurum to hide herself in a turkish friend's house she told prince argotinsky the representative of the all-russian urban union in erzurum that she shuddered to recall how hundreds of children were bayoneted by the turks and thrown into the euphrates and how men and women were stripped naked tied together in hundreds shot and then hurled into the river in a loop of the river near erzinghan she said the thousands of dead bodies created such a barrage that the euphrates changed its course for about a hundred yards it is absurd for the turkish government to assert that it ever seriously intended to deport the armenians to new homes the treatment which was given the convoys clearly shows that extermination was the real purpose of enver and talat how many exiled to the south under these revolting conditions ever reached their destinations the experiences of a single caravan show how completely this plan of deportation developed into one of annihilation the details in question were furnished me directly by the american consul at aleppo and are now on file in the state department at washington on the first of june a convoy of three thousand armenians mostly women girls and children left harput following the usual custom the government provided them an escort of seventy gendarmes under the command of a turkish leader a bey in accordance with a common experience these gendarmes proved to be not their protectors but their tormentors and their executioners hardly had they got well started on the road when bey took four hundred liras from the caravan on the plea that he was keeping it safely until their arrival at malaysia no sooner had he robbed them of the only thing that might have provided them with food than he ran away leaving them all to the tender mercies of the gendarmes all the way to ras ul ain the first station on the baghdad line the existence of these wretched travellers was one prolonged horror the gendarmes went ahead informing the half-savage tribes of the mountains that several thousand armenian women and girls were approaching the arabs and kurds began to carry off the girls the mountaineers fell upon them repeatedly violating and killing the women and the gendarmes themselves joined in the orgy one by one the few men who accompanied the convoy were killed the women had succeeded in secreting money from their persecutors keeping it in their mouths and hair with this they would buy horses only to have them repeatedly stolen by kurdish tribesmen finally the gendarmes having robbed and beaten and violated and killed their charges for thirteen days abandoned them altogether two days afterward the kurds went through the party and rounded up all the males who still remained alive they found about a hundred and fifty their ages varying from fifteen to ninety years and these they promptly took away and butchered to the last man but that same day another convoy from sivas joined this one from harput increasing the numbers of the whole caravan 
to eighteen thousand people. Another Curtis Bay now took command, and to him, as to all men placed in the same position, the opportunity was regarded merely as one for pillage, outrage, and murder. This chieftain summoned all his followers from the mountains, and invited them to work their complete will upon this great mass of Armenians. Day after day, and night after night, the prettiest girls were carried away. Sometimes they returned in a pitiable condition that told the full story of their sufferings. Any stragglers, those who were so old and infirm and sick that they could not keep up with the marchers, were promptly killed. Whenever they reached a Turkish village, all the local vagabonds were permitted to prey upon the Armenian girls. When the diminishing band reached the Euphrates, they saw the bodies of two hundred men floating upon the surface. By this time they had been so repeatedly robbed that they had practically nothing left except a few ragged clothes, and even these the Kurds now took, and the larger part of the convoy marched for five days almost completely naked under the scorching desert sun. For another five days they did not have a morsel of bread or a drop of water. Hundreds fell dead on the way, the report reads. Their tongues were turned to charcoal, and when, at the end of five days, they reached a fountain, the whole convoy naturally rushed toward it. But here the policemen barred the way, and forbade them to take a single drop of water. Their purpose was to sell it at from one to three liras a cup, and sometimes they actually withheld the water after getting the money. At another place where there were wells, some women threw themselves into them, as there was no rope or pail to draw up the water. These women were drowned, and, in spite of that, the rest of the people drank from that well, the dead bodies still remaining there and polluting the water. Sometimes, when the wells were shallow and the women could go down into them and come out again, the other people would rush to lick or suck their wet, dirty clothes in the effort to quench their thirst. When they passed an Arab village in their naked condition, the Arabs pitied them and gave them old pieces of cloth to cover themselves with. Some of the exiles who still had money bought some clothes, but some still remained who travelled thus naked all the way to the city of Aleppo. The poor women could hardly walk for shame. They all walked bent double. On the seventieth day a few creatures reached Aleppo. Out of the combined convoy of eighteen thousand souls, just one hundred and fifty women and children reached their destination. A few of the rest, the most attractive, were still living as captives of the Kurds and Turks. All the rest were dead. My only reason for relating such dreadful things as this is that, without the details, the English-speaking public cannot understand precisely what this nation is which we call Turkey. I have by no means told the most terrible details for a complete narration of the sadistic orgies of which these Armenian men and women were the victims can never be printed in an American publication. Whatever crimes the most perverted instincts of the human mind can devise, and whatever refinements of persecution and injustice the most debased imagination can conceive, became the daily misfortunes of this devoted people. I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. The great massacres and persecutions of the past seem almost insignificant when compared with the sufferings of the Armenian race in 1915. The slaughter of the Albigenses in the early part of the thirteenth century has always been regarded as one of the most pitiful events in history. In these outbursts of fanaticism, about sixty thousand people were killed. In the massacre of St. Bartholomew, about thirty thousand human beings lost their lives. The Sicilian Vespers, which has always figured as one of the most fiendish outbursts of this kind, caused the destruction of eight thousand. Volumes have been written about the Spanish Inquisition under Torquemada, 
yet in the eighteen years of his administration only a little more than eight thousand heretics were done to death. Perhaps the one event in history that most resembles the Armenian deportations was the expulsion of the Jews from Spain by Ferdinand and Isabella. According to Prescott, a hundred and sixty thousand were uprooted from their homes and scattered broadcast over Africa and Europe. Yet all these previous persecutions seem almost trivial when we compare them with the sufferings of the Armenians, in which at least six hundred thousand people were destroyed, and perhaps as many as a million. And these earlier massacres, when we compare them with the spirit that directed the Armenian atrocities, have one feature that we can almost describe as an excuse. They were the product of religious fanaticism, and most of the men and women who instigated them sincerely believed that they were devoutly serving their Maker. Undoubtedly religious fanaticism was an impelling motive with the Turkish and Kurdish rabble who slew Armenians as a service to Allah, but the men who really conceived the crime had no such motive. Practically all of them were atheists, with no more respect for Mohammedanism than for Christianity, and with them the one motive was cold-blooded, calculating state policy. The Armenians are not the only subject people in Turkey which have suffered from this policy of making Turkey exclusively the country of the Turks. The story which I have told about the Armenians I could also tell with certain modifications about the Greeks and the Syrians. Indeed, the Greeks were the first victims of this nationalizing idea. I have already described how, in the few months preceding the European war, the Ottoman government began deporting its Greek subjects along the coast of Asia Minor. These outrages aroused little interest in Europe or the United States, yet in the space of three or four months more than a hundred thousand Greeks were taken from their age-long homes in the Mediterranean littoral, and removed to the Greek islands of the interior. For the larger part, these were bona fide deportations, that is, the Greek inhabitants were actually removed to new places, and were not subjected to wholesale massacre. It was probably for the reason that the civilized world did not protest against these deportations that the Turks afterward decided to apply the same methods on a larger scale not only to the Greeks, but to the Armenians, Syrians, Nestorians, and others of its subject peoples. In fact, Bedri Bey, the prefect of police at Constantinople, himself told one of my secretaries that the Turks had expelled the Greeks so successfully that they had decided to apply the same method to all other races in the empire. The martyrdom of the Greeks, therefore, comprised two periods, that antedating the war, and that which began in the early part of 1915. The first affected chiefly the Greeks on the seacoast of Asia Minor. The second affected those living in Thrace and in the territories surrounding the Sea of Marmara, the Dardanelles, and the Bosporus, and the coast of the Black Sea. These latter, to the extent of several hundred thousand, were sent to the interior of Asia Minor. The Turks adopted almost identically the same procedure against the Greeks as that which they had adopted against the Armenians. They began by incorporating the Greeks into the Ottoman army, and then transforming them into labor battalions, using them to build roads in the Caucasus and other scenes of action. These Greek soldiers, just like the Armenians, died by thousands from cold, hunger, and other privations. The same house-to-house -house searches for hidden weapons took place in the Greek villages, and Greek men and women were beaten and tortured, just as were their fellow Armenians. The Greeks had to submit to the same forced requisitions, which amounted in their case, as in the case of the Armenians, merely to plundering on a wholesale scale. The Turks attempted to force the Greek subjects to become Mohammedans. Greek girls, just like the Armenian girls, were stolen and taken to Turkish harems, and Greek boys were kidnapped and placed in Muslim households. The Greeks, just like the Armenians, were accused of disloyalty to the Ottoman government, 
the Turks accused them of furnishing supplies to the English submarines in the Marmara, and also of acting as spies. The Turks also declared that the Greeks were not loyal to the Ottoman government, and that they also looked forward to the day when the Greeks inside of Turkey would become part of Greece. These latter charges were unquestionably true, that the Greeks, after suffering for five centuries the most unspeakable outrages at the hands of the Turks, should look longingly to the day when their territory should be part of the fatherland, was to be expected. The Turks, as in the case of the Armenians, seized upon this as an excuse for a violent onslaught on the whole race. Everywhere the Greeks were gathered in groups, and, under the so-called protection of Turkish gendarmes, they were transported, the larger part on foot, into the interior. Just how many were scattered in this fashion is not definitely known, the estimates varying anywhere from two hundred thousand up to a million. These caravans suffered great privations, but they were not submitted to the general massacre as were the Armenians, and this is probably the reason why the outside world has not heard so much about them. The Turks showed them this greater consideration not from any motive of pity. The Greeks, unlike the Armenians, had a government which was vitally interested in their welfare. At this time there was a general apprehension among the Teutonic allies that Greece would enter the war on the side of the Entente, and a wholesale massacre of Greeks in Asia Minor would unquestionably have produced such a state of mind in Greece that its pro-German king would have been unable longer to keep his country out of the war. It was only a matter of state policy, therefore, that saved these Greek subjects of Turkey from all the horrors that befell the Armenians. But their sufferings are still terrible, and constitute another chapter in the long story of crimes for which civilization will hold the Turk responsible. End of chapter 24《ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハッタイ・ハ but the tendency was at first to regard them as mere manifestations of the disorders that had prevailed in the Armenian provinces for many years. When the reports came from Urumia, both Enver and Talat dismissed them as wild exaggerations, and when, for the first time, we heard of the disturbances at Van, these Turkish officials declared that they were nothing more than a mob uprising which they would soon have under control. I now see what was not apparent in those early months, that the Turkish government was determined to keep the news, as long as possible, from the outside world. It was clearly the intention that Europe and America should hear of the annihilation of the Armenian race only after that annihilation had been accomplished. As the country which the Turks particularly wished to keep in ignorance was the United States, they resorted to the most shameless prevarications when discussing the situation with myself and with my staff. In early April the authorities arrested about two hundred Armenians in Constantinople and sent them into the interior. Many of those who were then deported were educational and social leaders and men who were prominent in industry and in finance. I knew many of these men, and therefore felt a personal interest in their misfortunes. But when I spoke to Talat about their expulsion, he replied that the government was acting in self-defense. The Armenians at Van, he said, had already shown their abilities as revolutionists. He knew that these leaders in Constantinople were corresponding with the Russians, and he had every reason to fear that they would start an insurrection against the central government. The safest plan, therefore, was to send them to Angora and other interior towns. Talat denied that this was part of any general concerted scheme to rid the city of its Armenian population, 
and insisted that the Armenian masses in Constantinople would not be disturbed. But soon the accounts from the interior became more specific and more disquieting. The withdrawal of the Allied fleet from the Dardanelles produced a distinct change in the atmosphere. Until then there were numerous indications that all was not going well in the Armenian provinces. When it at last became definitely established, however, that the traditional friends of Armenia, Great Britain, France, and Russia, could do nothing to help that suffering people, the mask began to disappear. In April I was suddenly deprived of the privilege of using the cipher for communicating with American consuls. The most rigorous censorship also was applied to letters. Such measures could mean only that things were happening in Asia Minor which the authorities were determined to conceal. But they did not succeed. Though all sorts of impediments were placed to traveling, certain Americans, chiefly missionaries, succeeded in getting through. For hours they would sit in my office, and with tears streaming down their faces they would tell me of the horrors through which they had passed. Many of these, both men and women, were almost broken in health from the scenes which they had witnessed. In many cases they brought me letters from American consuls, confirming the most dreadful of their narrations, and adding many unprintable details. The general purport of all these first-hand reports was that the utter depravity and fiendishness of the Turkish nature already sufficiently celebrated through the centuries, had now surpassed themselves. There was only one hope of saving nearly two million people from massacre, starvation, and even worse, I was told. That was the moral power of the United States. These spokesmen of a condemned nation declared that, unless the American ambassador could persuade the Turk to stay his destroying arm, the whole Armenian nation would disappear. It was not only American and Canadian missionaries who made this personal appeal. Several of their German associates begged me to intercede. These men and women confirmed all the worst things which I had heard, and they were unsparing in denouncing their own fatherland. They did not conceal the humiliation which they felt, as Germans, in the fact that their own nation was allied with a people that could perpetrate such infamies, but they understood German policy well enough to know that Germany would not intercede. There was no use in expecting aid from the Kaiser, they said. America must stop the massacres, or they would go on. Technically, of course, I had no right to interfere. According to the cold-blooded legalities of the situation, the treatment of Turkish subjects by the Turkish government was purely a domestic affair. Unless it directly affected American lives and American interests, it was outside the concern of the American government. When I first approached Talat on the subject, he called my attention to this fact in no uncertain terms. This interview was one of the most exciting which I had had up to that time. Two missionaries had just called upon me, giving the full details of the frightful happenings at Konya. After listening to their stories, I could not restrain myself, and went immediately to the sublime port. I saw at once that Talat was in one of his most ferocious states of mind. For months he had been attempting to secure the release of one of his closest friends, Ayub Sabri and Zinun, who were held as prisoners by the English at Malta. His failure in this matter was a constant grievance and irritation. He was always talking about it, always making new suggestions for getting his friends back to Turkey, and always appealing to me for help. So furious did the Turkish boss become when thinking about his absent friends that we usually referred to these manifestations as Talat in his Ayub Sabri moods. This particular morning, the Minister of the Interior was in one of his worst Ayub Sabri moods. Once more he had been working for the release of the exiles, and once more he had failed. As usual, he attempted to preserve outer calm and courtesy to me, but his short, snappy phrases, his bulldog rigidity, and his wrists planted on the table, showed that it was an unfavorable moment to stir him to any sense of pity or remorse. 
I first spoke to him about a Canadian missionary, Dr. McNaughton, who was receiving harsh treatment in Asia Minor. "'The man is an English agent,' he replied, "'and we have the evidence for it.' "'Let me see it,' I asked. "'We'll do nothing for any Englishman or any Canadian,' he replied, "'until they release Ayub and Zenun. "'But you promised to treat English in the employ of Americans as Americans,' I replied. "'That may be,' rejoined the minister. "'But a promise is not made to be kept forever. "'I withdraw that promise now. "'There is a time limit on a promise.' "'But if a promise is not binding, what is?' I asked." A guarantee, Talat answered quickly. This fine Turkish distinction had a certain metaphysical interest, but I had more practical matters to discuss at that time, so I began to talk about the Armenians at Konya. I had hardly started when Talat's attitude became even more belligerent. His eyes lighted up, he brought his jaws together, leaned over to me, and snapped out, "'Are they Americans?' The implications of this question were hardly diplomatic. It was merely a way of telling me that the matter was none of my business. In a moment Talat said this in so many words. "'The Armenians are not to be trusted,' he said. "'Besides, what we do with them does not concern the United States.' I replied that I regarded myself as the friend of the Armenians, and was shocked at the way that they were being treated." but he shook his head and refused to discuss the matter. I saw that nothing could be gained by forcing the issue at that time. I spoke in behalf of another British subject who was not being treated properly. "'He's English, isn't he?' answered Talat. "'Then I shall do as I like with him.' "'Eat him, if you wish,' I replied. "'No,' said Talat. "'He would go against my digestion.' He was altogether in a reckless mood. Gott strafe England, he shouted, using one of the few German phrases that he knew. As to your Armenians, we don't give a rap for the future. We live only in the present. As to the English, I wish you would telegraph Washington that we shall not do a thing for them until they let out Ayub Sabri and Zenun. Then, leaning over, he struck a pose, pressed his hand to his heart, and said in English, I think this must have been almost all the English he knew. Ayub Sabri, he my brother. Despite this, I made another plea for Dr. McNaughton. He's not American, said Talat. He's a Canadian. It's almost the same thing, I said. Well, replied Talat, if I let him go, will you promise that the United States will annex Canada? I promise, said I, and we both laughed at this little joke. "'Every time you come here,' Talat finally said, "'you always steal something from me. "'All right, you can have your McNaughton.' Certainly this interview was not an encouraging beginning so far as the Armenians were concerned, but Talat was not always in an Ayub Sabri mood. He went from one emotion to another as lightly as a child. I would find him fierce and unyielding one day, and uproariously good-natured and accommodating the next. Prudence indicated, therefore, that I should await one of his more congenial moments before approaching him on the subject that aroused all the barbarity in his nature. Such an opportunity was soon presented. One day, soon after the interview chronicled above, I called on Talat again. The first thing he did was to open his desk and pull out a handful of yellow cablegrams. "'Why don't you give this money to us?' he said with a grin. "'What money?' I asked. "'Here is a cablegram for you from America, sending you a lot of money for the Armenians. You ought not to use it that way. Give it to us Turks. We need it as badly as they do.' "'I have not received any such cablegram,' I replied. "'Oh, no, but you will,' he answered. "'I always get all your cablegrams first, you know. After I have finished reading them, I send them round to you.' This statement was the literal truth. Every morning all uncoded cablegrams received in Constantinople were forwarded to Talat, who read them before consenting to their being forwarded to their destinations. Even the cablegrams of the ambassadors were apparently not exempt, though, of course, the ciphered messages were not interfered with. 
Ordinarily I might have protested against this infringement of my rights, but Talat's engaging frankness about pilfering my correspondence, and even in waving my own cablegrams in my face, gave me an excellent opening to introduce the forbidden subject. But on this occasion, as on many others, Talat was evasive and non-committal, and showed much hostility to the interest which the American people were manifesting in the Armenians. He explained his policy on the ground that the Americans were in constant correspondence with the Russians. The definite conviction which these conversations left upon my mind was that Talat was the most implacable enemy of this persecuted race. He gave me the impression, such is the entry which I find in my diary on August 3rd, that Talat is the one who desires to crush the poor Armenians. He told me that the Union and Progress Committee had carefully considered the matter in all its details, and that the policy which was being pursued was that which they had officially adopted. He said that I must not get the idea that the deportations had been decided upon hastily. In reality, they were the result of prolonged and careful deliberation. To my repeated appeals that he should show mercy to these people, he sometimes responded seriously, sometimes angrily, and sometimes flippantly. Some day, he once said, I will come and discuss the whole Armenian subject with you. And then he added, in a low tone in Turkish, But that day will never come. Why are you so interested in the Armenians anyway, he said, on another occasion? You are a Jew. These people are Christians. The Mohammedans and the Jews always get on harmoniously. We are treating the Jews here all right. What have you to complain of? Why can't you let us do with these Christians as we please? I had frequently remarked that the Turks look upon practically every question as a personal matter, yet this point of view rather stunned me. However, it was a complete revelation of Turkish mentality, the fact that, above all considerations of race and religion, there are such things as humanity and civilization never for a moment enters their mind. They can understand a Christian fighting for a Christian, and a Jew fighting for a Jew, but such abstractions as justice and decency form no part of their conception of things. "'You don't seem to realize,' I replied, "'that I am not here as a Jew, but as American ambassador.' My country contains something more than ninety-seven million Christians and something less than three million Jews, so at least in my ambassadorial capacity I am ninety-seven percent Christian. But after all that is not the point. I do not appeal to you in the name of any race or any religion, but merely as a human being. You have told me many times that you want to make Turkey a part of the modern progressive world. The way you are treating the Armenians will not help you to realize that ambition. It puts you in the class of backward, reactionary peoples. "'We treat the Americans all right, too,' said Talat. "'I don't see why you should complain.' "'But Americans are outraged by your persecutions of the Armenians,' I replied. "'You must base your principles on humanitarianism, not racial discrimination, or the United States will not regard you as a friend and an equal.' and you should understand the great changes that are taking place among Christians all over the world. They are forgetting their differences, and all sects are coming together as one. You look down on American missionaries, but don't forget that it is the best element in America that supports their religious work, as well as their educational institutions. Americans are not mere materialists always chasing money. They are broadly humanitarian, and interested in the spread of justice and civilization throughout the world. After this war is over you will face a new situation. You say that, if victorious, you can defy the world, but you are wrong. You will have to meet public opinion everywhere, especially in the United States. Our people will never forget these massacres. They will always resent the wholesale destruction of Christians in Turkey. They will look upon it as nothing but willful murder, and will seriously condemn all the men who are responsible for it. You will not be able to protect yourself under your political status and say that you acted as Minister of the Interior, and not as Talat. 
you are defying all ideas of justice as we understand the term in our country. Strangely enough, these remarks did not offend Talat, but they did not shake his determination. I might as well have been talking to a stone wall. From my abstractions he immediately came down to something definite. These people, he said, refused to disarm when we told them to. They opposed us at Van and at Zetun, and they helped the Russians. There is only one way in which we can defend ourselves against them in the future, and that is just to deport them. Suppose a few Armenians did betray you, I said. Is that a reason for destroying a whole race? Is that an excuse for making innocent women and children suffer? Those things are inevitable, he replied. This remark to me was not quite so illuminating as one which Talat made subsequently to a reporter of the Berliner Tageblatt, who asked him the same question. We have been reproached, he said, according to this interviewer, for making no distinction between the innocent Armenians and the guilty. But that was utterly impossible, in view of the fact that those who were innocent to-day might be guilty to-morrow. One reason why Talat could not discuss this matter with me freely was because the member of the embassy staff who did the interpreting was himself an Armenian. In the early part of August, therefore, he sent a personal messenger to me, asking if I could not see him alone. He said that he himself would provide the interpreter. This was the first time that Talat had admitted that his treatment of the Armenians was a matter with which I had any concern. The interview took place two days afterward. It so happened that since the last time I had visited Talat, I had shaved my beard. As soon as I came in, the burly minister began talking in his customary bantering fashion. "'You have become a young man again,' he said. "'You are so young now that I cannot go to you for advice any more.' "'I have shaved my beard,' I replied, "'because it had become very grey, "'made grey by your treatment of the Armenians.' After this exchange of compliments, we settled down to the business in hand. "'I have asked you to come to-day,' began Talat, "'so that I can explain our position on the whole Armenian subject. "'We base our objections to the Armenians on three distinct grounds. "'In the first place, they have enriched themselves at the expense of the Turks. "'In the second place, they are determined to domineer over us and to establish a separate state.' In the third place, they have openly encouraged our enemies. They have assisted the Russians in the Caucasus, and our failure there is largely explained by their actions. We have therefore come to the irrevocable decision that we shall make them powerless before this war is ended. On every one of these points I had plenty of arguments in rebuttal. Talat's first objection was merely an admission that the Armenians were more industrious and more able than the dull-witted and lazy Turks. Massacre as a means of destroying business competition was certainly an original conception. His general charge that the Armenians were conspiring against Turkey, and that they openly sympathized with Turkey's enemies, merely meant, when reduced to its original elements, that the Armenians were constantly appealing to the European powers to protect them against robbery, murder, and outrage. The Armenian problem, like most race problems, was the result of centuries of ill-treatment and injustice. There could be only one solution for it, the creation of an orderly system of government in which all citizens were to be treated upon an equality and in which all offences were to be punished as the acts of individuals, and not as of peoples. I argued for a long time along these and similar lines. "'It is no use for you to argue,' Talat answered. "'We have already disposed of three-quarters of the Armenians. There are none at all left in Bitlis, Van, and Erzurum. The hatred between the Turks and the Armenians is now so intense that we have got to finish with them.' If we don't, they will plan their revenge. If you are not influenced by humane considerations, I replied, think of the material loss. These people are your businessmen. They control many of your industries. 
They are very large taxpayers. What would become of you commercially without them? We care nothing about the commercial loss, replied Talat. We have figured all that out, and we know that it will not exceed five million pounds. We don't worry about that. I have asked you to come here so as to let you know that our Armenian policy is absolutely fixed, and that nothing can change it. We will not have the Armenians anywhere in Anatolia. They can live in the desert, but nowhere else. I still attempted to persuade Talat that the treatment of the Armenians was destroying Turkey in the eyes of the world, and that his country would never be able to recover from this infamy. "'You are making a terrible mistake,' I said, and I repeated the statement three times. "'Yes, we may make mistakes,' he replied. "'But,' and he firmly closed his lips and shook his head, "'we never regret.' I had many talks with Talat on the Armenians, but I never succeeded in moving him to the slightest degree. He always came back to the points which he had made in this interview. He was very willing to grant any request I made in behalf of the Americans, or even of the French and English, but I could obtain no general concessions for the Armenians. He seemed to me always to have the deepest personal feeling in this matter, and his antagonism to the Armenians seemed to increase as their sufferings increased. One day, discussing a particular Armenian, I told Talat that he was mistaken in regarding this man as an enemy of the Turks, that in reality he was their friend. "'No Armenian,' replied Talat, "'can be our friend after what we have done to them.' One day Talat made what was perhaps the most astonishing request I have ever heard. The New York Life Insurance Company and the Equitable Life of New York had for years done considerable business among the Armenians. The extent to which this people insured their lives was merely another indication of their thrifty habits. "'I wish,' Talat now said, "'that you would get the American life insurance companies "'to send us a complete list of their Armenian policyholders. "'They are practically all dead now "'and have no heirs to collect the money. "'It, of course, all escheats to the state. "'The government is the beneficiary now. "'Will you do so?' "'This was almost too much, and I lost my temper. "'You will get no such list from me,' I said, "'and I got up and left him.' One other episode involving the Armenians stirred Talat to one of his most ferocious moods. In the latter part of September, Mrs. Morgenthau left for America. The sufferings of the Armenians had greatly preyed upon her mind, and she really left for home because she could no longer endure to live in such a country. But she determined to make one last intercession for this poor people on her own account. Her way home took her through Bulgaria, and she had received an intimation that Queen Eleanor of that country would be glad to receive her. Perhaps it was Mrs. Morgenthau's well-known interest in social work that led to this invitation. Queen Eleanor was a high-minded woman, who had led a sad and lonely existence, and who was spending most of her time attempting to improve the condition of the poor in Bulgaria. She knew all about social work in American cities, and, a few years before, she had made all her plans to visit the United States in order to study our settlements at first hand. At the time of Mrs. Morgenthau's visit, the Queen had two American nurses from the Henry Street Settlement of New York instructing a group of Bulgarian girls in the methods of the American Red Cross. My wife was mainly interested in visiting the Queen in order that, as one woman to another, she might make a plea for the Armenians. At that time the question of Bulgaria's entrance into the war had reached a critical stage, and Turkey was prepared to make concessions to gain her as an ally. It was therefore a propitious moment to make such an appeal. The Queen received Mrs. Morgenthau informally, and my wife spent about an hour telling her all about the Armenians. Most of what she said was entirely new to the Queen— Little yet had appeared in the European press on this subject, and Queen Eleanor was precisely the kind of woman from whom the truth would be concealed as long as possible. 
Mrs. Morgenthau gave her all the facts about the treatment of Armenian women and children, and asked her to intercede on their behalf. She even went so far as to suggest that it would be a terrible thing if Bulgaria, which in the past had herself suffered such atrocities at the hands of the Turks, should now become their allies in war. Queen Eleanor was greatly moved. She thanked my wife for telling her these truths, and said that she would investigate immediately and see if something could not be done. Just as Mrs. Morgenthau was getting ready to leave, she saw the Duke of Mecklenburg standing near the door. The Duke was in Sofia at that time, attempting to arrange for Bulgaria's participation in the war. The Queen introduced him to Mrs. Morgenthau. His Highness was polite, but his air was rather cold and injured. His whole manner, particularly the stern glances which he cast on Mrs. Morgenthau, showed that he had heard a considerable part of the conversation. As he was exerting all his efforts to bring Bulgaria in on Germany's side, it is not surprising that he did not relish the plea which Mrs. Morgenthau was making to the Queen that Bulgaria should not ally herself with Turkey. Queen Eleanor immediately interested herself in the Armenian cause, and, as a result, the Bulgarian minister to Turkey was instructed to protest against the atrocities. This protest accomplished nothing, but it did arouse Talat's momentary wrath against the American ambassador. A few days afterward, when routine business called me to the sublime port, I found him in an exceedingly ugly humor. He answered most of my questions savagely and in monosyllables, and I was afterward told that Mrs. Morgenthau's intercession with the Queen had put him into this mood. In a few days, however, he was as good-natured as ever, for Bulgaria had taken sides with Turkey. Talat's attitude towards the Armenians was summed up in the proud boast which he made to his friends. I have accomplished more toward solving the Armenian problem in three months than Abdul Hamid accomplished in thirty years. End of chapter 25「Chapter twenty six of Ambassador Morgenthau's Story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anver Pasha discusses the Armenians. All this time I was bringing pressure upon Enver also. The Minister of War, as I have already indicated, was a different type of man from Talat. He concealed his real feelings much more successfully. He was usually suave, cold-blooded, and scrupulously polite. And at first he was by no means so callous as Talat in discussing the Armenians. He dismissed the early stories as wild exaggerations declared that the troubles at Van were merely ordinary warfare, and attempted to quiet my fears that the wholesale annihilation of the Armenians had been decided on. Yet all the time that Enver was attempting to deceive me, he was making open admissions to other people, a fact of which I was aware. In particular he made no attempt to conceal the real situation from Dr. Lepsius, a representative of German missionary interests. Dr. Lepsius was a high-minded Christian gentleman. He had been all through the Armenian massacres of 1895, and he had raised considerable sums of money to build orphanages for Armenian children who had lost their parents at that time. He came again in 1915 to investigate the Armenian situation in behalf of German missionary interests. He asked for the privilege of inspecting the reports of American consuls, and I granted it. These documents, supplemented by other information which Dr. Lepsius obtained, largely from German missionaries in the interior, left no doubt in his mind as to the policy of the Turks. His feelings were aroused chiefly against his own government. He expressed to me the humiliation which he felt, as a German, that the Turks should set about to exterminate their Christian subjects, while Germany, which called itself a Christian country, was making no endeavors to prevent it. 
From him, Enver scarcely concealed the official purpose. Dr. Lepsius was simply staggered by his frankness, for Enver told him in so many words that they at last had an opportunity to rid themselves of the Armenians, and that they proposed to use it. By this time Enver had become more frank with me. The circumstantial reports which I possessed made it useless for him to attempt to conceal the true situation further, and we had many long and animated discussions on the subject. One of these I recall with particular vividness. I notified Enver that I intended to take up the matter in detail, and he laid aside enough time to go over the whole situation. The Armenians had a fair warning, Enver began, of what would happen to them in case they joined our enemies. Three months ago I sent for the Armenian patriarch, and told him that if the Armenians attempted to start a revolution, or to assist the Russians, I would be unable to prevent mischief from happening to them. My warning produced no effect, and the Armenians started a revolution and helped the Russians. You know what happened at Van. They obtained control of the city, used bombs against government buildings, and killed a large number of Muslims. We knew that they were planning uprisings in other places. You must understand that we are now fighting for our lives at the Dardanelles, and that we are sacrificing thousands of men. While we are engaged in such a struggle as this, we cannot permit people in our own country to attack us in the back. We have got to prevent this no matter what means we have to resort to. It is absolutely true that I am not opposed to the Armenians as a people. I have the greatest admiration for their intelligence and industry, and I should like nothing better than to see them become a real part of our nation. But if they ally themselves with our enemies, as they did in the Van district, they will have to be destroyed. I have taken pains to see that no injustice is done. Only recently I gave orders to have three Armenians who had been deported returned to their homes when I found that they were innocent. Russia, France, Great Britain, and America are doing the Armenians no kindness by sympathizing with and encouraging them. I know what such encouragement means to a people who are inclined to revolution. When our Union and Progress Party attacked Abdul Hamid, we received all our moral encouragement from the outside world. This encouragement was of great help to us, and had much to do with our success. It might similarly now help the Armenians and their revolutionary program. I am sure that if these outside countries did not encourage them, they would give up all their efforts to oppose the present government and become law-abiding citizens. We now have this country in our absolute control, and we can easily revenge ourselves on any revolutionists. After all, I said, suppose what you say is true. Why not punish the guilty? Why sacrifice a whole race for the alleged crimes of individuals? Your point is all right during peace times, replied Enver. We can then use platonic means to quiet Armenians and Greeks, but in time of war we cannot investigate and negotiate. We must act promptly and with determination. I also think that the Armenians are making a mistake in depending upon the Russians. The Russians really would rather see them killed than alive. They are as great a danger to the Russians as they are to us. If they should form an independent government in Turkey, the Armenians in Russia would attempt to form an independent government there. The Armenians have also been guilty of massacres. In the entire district around Van, only thirty thousand Turks escaped. All the rest were murdered by the Armenians and Kurds. I attempted to protect the non-combatants at the Caucasus. I gave orders that they should not be injured, but I found that the situation was beyond my control. There are about seventy thousand Armenians in Constantinople, and they will not be molested, except those who are Dashnagists and those who are plotting against the Turks. However, I think you can ease your mind on the whole subject, 
as there will be no more massacres of Armenians. I did not take seriously Enver's concluding statement. At the time that he was speaking, massacres and deportations were taking place all over the Armenian provinces, and they went on almost without interruption for several months. As soon as the reports reached the United States, the question of relief became a pressing one. In the latter part of July, I heard that there were five thousand Armenians from Zeytun and Sultanie who were receiving no food whatever. I spoke about them to Enver, who positively declared that they would receive proper food. He did not receive favorably any suggestion that American representatives should go to that part of the country and assist and care for the exiles. For any American to do this, he said, would encourage all Armenians and make further trouble. There are twenty-eight million people in Turkey, and one million Armenians, and we do not propose to have one million disturb the peace of the rest of the population. The great trouble with the Armenians is that they are separatists. They are determined to have a kingdom of their own, and they have allowed themselves to be fooled by the Russians. Because they have relied upon the friendship of the Russians, they have helped them in this war. We are determined that they shall behave just as Turks do. You must remember that when we started this revolution in Turkey, there were only two hundred of us. With these few followers we were able to deceive the Sultan and the public, who thought that we were immensely more numerous and more powerful than we were. We really prevailed upon him and the public through our sheer audacity, and in this way we established the Constitution. It is our own experience with revolutions which makes us fear the Armenians. If two hundred Turks could overturn the government, then a few hundred bright, educated Armenians could do the same thing. We have therefore deliberately adopted the plan of scattering them so that they can do us no harm. As I told you once before, I warned the Armenian patriarch that if the Armenians attacked us while we were engaged in a foreign war, that we Turks would hit back, and that we would hit back indiscriminately. Enver always resented any suggestion that American missionaries or other friends of the Armenians should go to help or comfort them. They show altogether too much sympathy for them, he said over and over again. I had suggested that particular Americans should go to Tarsus and Marsavan. If they should go there, I am afraid that the local people in those cities would become angry, and they would be inclined to start some disturbance which might create an incident. It is better for the Armenians themselves, therefore, that the American missionaries should keep away from them. "'But you are ruining your country economically,' I said at another time, making the same point that I had made to Talat. And he answered it in almost the same words, thus showing that the subject had been completely canvassed by the ruling powers. Economic considerations are of no importance at this time. The only important thing is to win. That's the only thing we have on our mind. If we win, everything will be all right. If we lose, everything will be all wrong anyhow. Our situation is desperate, I admit it, and we are fighting as desperate men fight. We are not going to let the Armenians attack us in the rear. The question of relief to the starving Armenians became every week a more pressing one, but Enver still insisted that Americans should keep away from the Armenian provinces. How can we furnish bread to the Armenians, Enver declared, when we can't get enough for our own people? I know that they are suffering, and that it is quite likely that they cannot get bread at all this coming winter. But we have the utmost difficulty in getting flour and clothing right here in Constantinople. I said that I had the money, and that American missionaries were anxious to go and use it for the benefit of the refugees. We don't want the Americans to feed the Armenians, he flatly replied. That is one of the worst things that could happen to them. I have already said that it is their belief that they have friends in other countries which leads them to oppose the government, and so brings down upon them all their miseries. 
if you americans begin to distribute food and clothing among them they will then think that they have powerful friends in the united states this will encourage them to rebellion again and then we shall have to punish them still more if you will give such money as you have received to the turks we shall see that it is used for the benefit of the armenians enver made this proposal with a straight face and he made it not only on this occasion but on several others at the very moment that enver suggested this mechanism of relief the turkish gendarmes and the turkish officials were not only robbing the armenians of all their household possessions of all their food and all their money but they were even stripping women of their last shreds of clothing and prodding their naked bodies with bayonets as they staggered across the burning desert and the minister of war now proposed that we give our american money to these same guardians of the law for distribution among their charges however i had to be tactful if you or other heads of the government would become personally responsible for the distribution i said of course we would be glad to entrust the money to you but naturally you would not expect us to give this money to the men who have been killing the armenians and outraging their women but enver returned to his main point they must never know he said that they have a friend in the united states that would absolutely ruin them it is far better that they starve and in saying this i am really thinking of the welfare of the armenians themselves if they can only be convinced that they have no friends in other countries then they will settle down recognize that turkey is their only refuge and become quiet citizens your country is doing them no kindness by constantly showing your sympathy you are merely drawing upon them greater hardships in other words the more money which the americans sent to feed the armenians the more armenians turkey intended to massacre enver's logic was fairly maddening yet he did relent at the end and permit me to help the sufferers through certain missionaries in all our discussions he made this hypocritical plea that he was really a friend of this distracted nation and that even the severity of the measures which he had adopted was mercy in disguise since enver always asserted that he wished to treat the armenians with justice in this his attitude to me was quite different from that of talat who openly acknowledged his determination to deport them i went to the pains of preparing an elaborate plan for bettering their condition i suggested that if he wished to be just he should protect the innocent refugees and lessen this suffering as much as possible and that for that purpose he should appoint a special committee of armenians to assist him and send a capable armenian such as oskan effendi formerly minister of posts and telegraphs to study conditions and submit suggestions for remedying the existing evils enver did not approve either of my proposals as to the first he said that his colleagues would misunderstand it and as to oskan he said that he admired him for his good work while he had been in the cabinet and had backed him in his severity toward the inefficient officials yet he could not trust him because he was a member of the armenian dashnagist society in another talk with enver i began by suggesting that the central government was probably not to blame for the massacres i thought that this would not be displeasing to him of course i know that the cabinet would never order such terrible things as have taken place i said you and talat and the rest of the committee can hardly be held responsible undoubtedly your subordinates have gone much further than you have ever intended i realize that it is not always easy to control your underlings enver straightened up at once i saw that my remarks far from smoothing the way to quiet and friendly discussion had greatly offended him i had intimated that things could happen in turkey for which he and his associates were not responsible you are greatly mistaken he said 
We have this country absolutely under our control. I have no desire to shift the blame on to our underlings, and I am entirely willing to accept the responsibility myself for everything that has taken place. The cabinet itself has ordered the deportations. I am convinced that we are completely justified in doing this owing to the hostile attitude of the Armenians toward the Ottoman government. But we are the real rulers of Turkey, and no underling would dare proceed in a matter of this kind without our orders. Enver tried to mitigate the barbarity of his general attitude by showing mercy in particular instances. I made no progress in my efforts to stop the program of wholesale massacre, but I did save a few Armenians from death. One day I received word from the American consul at Smyrna that seven Armenians had been sentenced to be hanged. These men had been accused of committing some rather vague political offense in 1909, yet neither Rami Bey, the governor-general of Smyrna, nor the military commander believed that they were guilty. When the order for execution reached Smyrna, these authorities wired Constantinople that under the Ottoman law the accused had the right to appeal for clemency to the Sultan. The answer which was returned to this communication well illustrated the extent to which the rights of the Armenians were regarded at that time. Technically, you are right. Hang them first, and send the petition for pardon afterward. I visited Enver in the interest of these men on Bayram, which is the greatest Mohammedan religious festival. It is the day that succeeds Ramadan, their month of fasting. Bayram has one feature in common with Christmas, for on that day it is customary for Mohammedans to exchange small presents, usually sweets. So after the usual remarks of felicitation, I said to Enver, "'Today is Bayram, and you haven't sent me any present yet.' Enver laughed. "'What do you want? Shall I send you a box of candies?' "'Oh, no,' I answered. "'I am not so cheap as that. I want the pardon of the seven Armenians whom the court-martial has condemned at Smyrna.' The proposition apparently struck Enver as very amusing. "'That's a funny way of asking for a pardon,' he said. However, since you put it that way, I can't refuse. He immediately sent for his aide, and telegraphed to Smyrna, setting the men free. Thus fortuitously is justice administered and decision involving human lives made in Turkey. Nothing could make clearer the slight estimation in which the Turks hold life, and the slight extent to which principle controls their conduct. Enver spared these men not because he had the slightest interest in their cases, but simply as a personal favor to me, and largely because of the whimsical manner in which I asked it. In all my talks on the Armenians, the Minister of War treated the whole matter more or less casually. He could discuss the fate of a race in a parenthesis, and refer to the massacre of children as nonchalantly as we would speak of the weather. One day Enver asked me to ride with him in the Belgrade forest. As I was losing no opportunities to influence him, I accepted this invitation. We autoed to Buyuk Dere, where four attendants with horses met us. In our ride through the beautiful forest, Enver became rather more communicative in his conversation than ever before. He spoke affectionately of his father and mother. When they were married, he said, his father had been sixteen and his mother only eleven, and he himself had been born when his mother was fifteen. In talking of his wife, the imperial princess, he disclosed a much softer side to his nature than I had hitherto seen. He spoke of the dignity with which she graced his home, regretted that Mohammedan ideas of propriety prohibited her from entering social life, but expressed a wish that she and Mrs. Morgenthau could meet. He was then furnishing a beautiful new palace on the Bosporus. When this was finished, he said, the princess would invite my wife to breakfast. Just then we were passing the house and grounds of Senator Abraham Pasha, a very rich Armenian.
This man had been an intimate friend of the Sultan Abdul Aziz, and, since in Turkey a man inherits his father's friends as well as his property, the Crown Prince of Turkey, a son of Abdul Aziz, made weekly visits to this distinguished senator. As we passed through the park, Enver noticed with disgust that woodmen were cutting down trees and stopped them. When I heard afterward that the Minister of War had bought this park, I understood one of the reasons for his anger. Since Abraham Pasha was an Armenian, this gave me an opportunity to open the subject again. I spoke to him of the terrible treatment from which the Armenian women were suffering. "'You said that you wanted to protect women and children,' I remarked, "'but I know that your orders are not being carried out.' "'Those stories can't be true,' he said. "'I cannot conceive that a Turkish soldier would ill-treat a woman who is with child.' Perhaps if Enver could have read the circumstantial reports which were then lying in the archives of the American embassy, he might have changed his mind. Shifting the conversation once more, he asked me about my saddle, which was the well-known General McClellan type. Enver tried it and liked it so much that he afterward borrowed it, and had one made exactly like it for himself, even including the number in one corner, and adopted it for one of his regiments. He told me of the railroads which he was then building in Palestine, said how well the cabinet was working, and pointed out that there were great opportunities in Turkey now for real estate speculation. He even suggested that he and I join hands in buying land that was sure to rise in value. But I insisted in talking about the Armenians. However, I made no more progress than before. We shall not permit them to cluster in places where they can plot mischief and help our enemies, so we are going to give them new quarters. This ride was so successful, from Enver's point of view, that we took another a few days afterward, and this time Talat and Dr. Gates, the president of Robert College, accompanied us. Enver and I rode ahead, while our companions brought up the rear. These Turkish officials are exceedingly jealous of their prerogatives, and, since the Minister of War is the ranking member of the Cabinet, Enver insisted on keeping a decorous interval between ourselves and the other pair of horsemen. I was somewhat amused by this, for I knew that Talat was the more powerful politician, yet he accepted the discrimination, and only once did he permit his horse to pass Enver and myself. At this violation of the proprieties, Enver showed his displeasure, whereas Talat paused, reined up his horse, and passed submissively to the rear. "'I was merely showing Dr. Gates the gait of my horse,' he said with an apologetic air. But I was interested in more important matters than such fine distinctions in official etiquette. I was determined to talk about the Armenians.' but again I failed to make any progress. Enver found more interesting subjects of discussion. He began to talk of his horses, and now another incident illustrated the mercurial quality of the Turkish mind. The readiness with which a Turk passes from acts of monstrous criminality to acts of individual kindness. Enver said that the horse races would take place soon, and regretted that he had no jockey. "'I'll give you an English jockey,' I said. "'Will you make a bargain? He is a prisoner of war. If he wins, will you give him his freedom?' "'I'll do it,' said Enver. This man, whose name was Fields, actually entered the races as Enver's jockey, and came in third. He rode for his freedom, as Mr. Philip said. Since he did not come in first, the minister was not obliged by the terms of his agreement to let him return to England, but Enver stretched a point and gave him his liberty. On this same ride Enver gave me an exhibition of his skill as a marksman. At one point in the road I suddenly heard a pistol shot ring out in the air. It was Enver's aide practicing on a nearby object. Immediately Enver dismounted, whipped out his revolver, and thrusting his arm out rigidly and horizontally, he took aim. "'Do you see that twig on that tree?' he asked me. 
It was about thirty feet away. When I nodded, Enver fired, and the twig dropped to the ground. The rapidity with which Enver could whip his weapon out of his pocket, aim and shoot, gave me one convincing explanation for the influence which he exercised with the piratical crew that was then ruling Turkey. There were plenty of stories floating around that Enver did not hesitate to use this method of suasion at certain critical moments of his career. How true these anecdotes were I do not know, but I can certainly testify to the high character of his marksmanship. Talat also began to amuse himself in the same way, and finally the two statesmen started shooting in competition and behaving as gaily and as carefree as boys let out of school. "'Have you one of your cards with you?' asked Enver. He requested that I pin it to a tree, which stood about fifty feet away. Enver then fired first. His hand was steady, his eye went straight to the mark, and the bullet hit the card directly in the center. This success rather nettled Talat. He took aim, but his rough hand and wrist shook slightly. He was not an athlete like his younger, wiry, and straight-backed associate. Several times Talat hit around the edges of the card, but he could not duplicate Enver's skill. "'If it had been a man I was firing at,' said the bulky Turk, jumping on his horse again, "'I would have hit him several times.' So ended my attempts to interest the two most powerful Turks of their day in the fate of one of the most valuable elements in their empire. I have already said that Said Halim, the Grand Vizier, was not an influential personage. Nominally his office was the most important in the empire. Actually the Grand Vizier was a mere place-warmer and Talat and Enver controlled the present incumbent, precisely as they controlled the sultan himself. Technically the ambassadors should have conducted their negotiations with Said Halim, for he was minister of foreign affairs. I early discovered, however, that nothing could be accomplished this way, and though I still made my Monday calls as a matter of courtesy, I preferred to deal directly with the men who had the real power to decide all matters. In order that I might not be accused of neglecting any means of influencing the Ottoman government, I brought the Armenian question several times to the Grand Vizier's attention. As he was not a Turk, but an Egyptian, and a man of education and breeding, it seemed not unlikely that he might have a somewhat different attitude toward the subject peoples but I was wrong. The Grand Vizier was just as hostile to the Armenians as Talat and Enver. I soon found that merely mentioning the subject irritated him greatly. Evidently he did not care to have his elegant case interfered with by such disagreeable and unimportant subjects. The Grand Vizier showed his attitude when the Greek chargé d'affaires spoke to him about the persecutions of the Greeks. Said Halim said that such manifestations did the Greeks more harm than good. "'We shall do with them just the opposite from what we are asked to do,' said the Grand Vizier. To my appeals, the nominal chief minister was hardly more statesmanlike. I had the disagreeable task of sending him, in behalf of the British, French, and Russian governments, a notification that these powers would hold personally responsible for the Armenian atrocities the men who were then directing Ottoman affairs. This meant, of course, that in the event of Allied success they would treat the Grand Vizier, Talat, Enver, Jemal, and their companions as ordinary murderers. As I came into the room to discuss this somewhat embarrassing message with this member of the Royal House of Egypt, he sat there as usual, nervously fingering his beads, and not in a particularly genial frame of mind. He at once spoke of this telegram. His face flushed with anger, and he began a long diatribe against the whole Armenian race. He declared that the Armenian rebels had killed a 120,000 Turks at Van. 
This and other of his statements were so absurd that I found myself spiritedly defending the persecuted race, and this aroused the Grand Vizier's wrath still further, and, switching from the Armenians, he began to abuse my own country, making the usual charge that our sympathy with the Armenians was largely responsible for all their troubles. Soon after this interview, Said Halim ceased to be the Minister for Foreign Affairs. His successor was Halil Bey, who for several years had been Speaker of the Turkish Parliament. Halil was a very different type of man. He was much more tactful, much more intelligent, and much more influential in Turkish affairs. He was also a smooth and oily conversationalist, good-natured and fat, and by no means so lost to all decent sentiments as most Turkish politicians of the time. It was generally reported that Halil did not approve the Armenian proceedings, yet his official position compelled him to accept them, and even, as I now discovered, to defend them. Soon after obtaining his cabinet post, Halil called upon me and made a somewhat rambling explanation of the Armenian atrocities. I had already had experiences with several official attitudes toward the persecutions. Talat had been bloodthirsty and ferocious, Enver subtly calculating, while the Grand Vizier had been testy. Halil now regarded the elimination of this race with the utmost good humor. Not a single aspect of the proceeding, not even the unkindest things I could say concerning it, disturbed his equanimity in the least. He began by admitting that nothing could palliate these massacres, but he added that, in order to understand them, there were certain facts that I should keep in mind. "'I agree that the government has made serious mistakes in the treatment of the Armenians,' said Halil, "'but the harm has already been done. What can we do about it now?' Still, if there are any errors we can correct, we should correct them. I deplore as much as you the excesses and the violations which have been committed. I wish to present to you the view of the sublime port. I admit that this is no justification, but I think there are extenuating circumstances that you should take into consideration before judgment is passed upon the Ottoman government. And then, like all the others, he went back to the happenings at Van, the desire of the Armenians for independence, and the help which they had given the Russians. I had heard it all many times before. I told Vartkus, an Armenian deputy who, like many other Armenian leaders, was afterward murdered, that, if his people really aspired to an independent existence, they should wait for a propitious moment. Perhaps the Russians might defeat the Turkish troops and occupy all the Armenian provinces. Then I could understand that the Armenians might want to set up for themselves. Why not wait, I told Vartkus, until such a fortunate time had arrived? I warned him that we would not let the Armenians jump on our backs, and that if they did engage in hostile acts against our troops, we would dispose of all Armenians who were in the rear of our army and that our method would be to send them to a safe distance in the south. Enver, as you know, gave a similar warning to the Armenian patriarch, but in spite of these friendly warnings they started a revolution. I asked about methods of relief, and told him that already twenty thousand pounds, a hundred thousand dollars, had reached me from America. "'It is the business of the Ottoman government,' he blandly answered, to see that these people are settled, housed, and fed until they can support themselves. The government will naturally do its duty. Besides, the twenty thousand pounds that you have is in reality nothing at all. That is true, I answered. It is only a beginning, but I am sure that I can get all the money we need. It is the opinion of Enver Pasha, he replied, that no foreigners should help the Armenians. I do not say that his reasons are right or wrong. I merely give them to you as they are. Enver says that the Armenians are idealists, and that the moment foreigners approach and help them, they will be encouraged in their national aspirations. 
he is utterly determined to cut forever all relations between the Armenians and foreigners. Is this Enver's way of stopping any further action on their part? I asked. Halil smiled most good-naturedly at this somewhat pointed question, and answered, The Armenians have no further means of action whatever. Since not far from five hundred thousand Armenians had been killed by this time, Halil's genial retort certainly had one virtue which most of his other statements in this interview had lacked. It was the truth. How many Armenians in the southern provinces are in need of help? I asked. I do not know. I would not even give you an approximate figure. Are there several hundred thousand? I should think so, Halil admitted, but I cannot say how many hundred thousand. A great many suffered, he added, simply because Enver could not spare troops to defend them. Some regular troops did accompany them, and these behaved very well. Forty even lost their lives defending the Armenians. But we had to withdraw most of the gendarmes for service in the army, and put in a new lot to accompany the Armenians. It is true that these gendarmes committed many deplorable excesses. A great many Turks do not approve these measures, I said. I do not deny it, replied the ever-accommodating Halil, as he bowed himself out. Enver, Halil, and the rest were ever insistent on the point which they constantly raised, that no foreigners should furnish relief to the Armenians. A few days after this visit the Under-Secretary of State called at the American Embassy, he came to deliver to me a message from Jamal to Enver. Jamal, who then had jurisdiction over the Christians in Syria, was much annoyed at the interest which the American consuls were displaying in the Armenians. He now asked me to order these officials to stop busying themselves in Armenian affairs. Jamal could not distinguish between the innocent and the guilty, the messenger said, and so he had to punish them all. Some time afterward Halil complained to me that the American consuls were sending facts about the Armenians to America, and that the government insisted that they should be stopped. As a matter of fact, I was myself sending most of this information, and I did not stop. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Ambassador Morgenthau's Story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I shall do nothing for the Armenians, says the German ambassador. I suppose that there is no phase of the Armenian question which has aroused more interest than this. Had the Germans any part in it? To what extent was the Kaiser responsible for the wholesale slaughter of this nation? Did the Germans favor it? Did they merely acquiesce, or did they oppose the persecutions? Germany, in the last four years, has become responsible for many of the blackest pages in history. Is she responsible for this, unquestionably the blackest of all? I presume most people will detect in the remarks of these Turkish chieftains certain resemblances to the German philosophy of war. Let me repeat particular phrases used by Enver and other Turks while discussing the Armenian massacres. The Armenians have brought this fate upon themselves. They had a fair warning of what would happen to them. We were fighting for our national existence. We were justified in resorting to any means that would accomplish these ends. We have no time to separate the innocent from the guilty. The only thing we have on our mind is to win the war. These phrases somehow have a familiar ring, do they not? Indeed, I might rewrite all these interviews with Enver, use the word Belgium in place of Armenia, put the words in a German general's mouth instead of Enver's, and we should have almost a complete exposition of the German attitude toward subject peoples. But the teachings of the Prussians go deeper than this. There was one feature about the Armenian proceedings that was new, that was not Turkish at all. 
For centuries the Turks have ill-treated their Armenians and all their other subject peoples with inconceivable barbarity. Yet their methods have always been crude, clumsy, and unscientific. They excelled in beating out an Armenian's brains with a club, and this unpleasant illustration is a perfect indication of the rough and primitive methods which they applied to the Armenian problem. They have understood the uses of murder, but not of murder as a fine art. But the Armenian proceedings of 1915 and 1916 evidenced an entirely new mentality. This new conception was that of deportation. The Turks, in five hundred years, had invented innumerable ways of physically torturing their Christian subjects, yet never before had it occurred to their minds to move them bodily from their homes, where they had lived for many thousands of years, and send them hundreds of miles away into the desert. Where did the Turks get this idea? I have already described how, in 1914, just before the European War, the government moved not far from a hundred thousand Greeks from their age-long homes along the Asiatic littoral to certain islands in the Aegean. I have also said that Admiral Usedom, one of the big German naval experts in Turkey, told me that the Germans had suggested this deportation to the Turks. But the all-important point is that this idea of deporting peoples en masse is, in modern times, exclusively Germanic. Anyone who reads the literature of Pan-Germany constantly meets it. These enthusiasts for a German world have deliberately planned, as part of their program, the ousting of the French from certain parts of France, of Belgians from Belgium, of Poles from Poland, of Slavs from Russia, and other indigenous peoples from the territories which they have inhabited for thousands of years, and the establishment in the vacated lands of solid, honest Germans. But it is hardly necessary to show that the Germans have advocated this as a state policy. They have actually been doing it in the last four years. They have moved we do not know how many thousands of Belgians and French from their native land. Austria-Hungary has killed a large part of the Serbian population and moved thousands of Serbian children into her own territories, intending to bring them up as loyal subjects of the empire. To what degree this movement of populations has taken place, we shall not know until the end of the war, but it has certainly gone on extensively. Certain German writers have even advocated the application of this policy to the Armenians. According to the Paris Tom, Paul Rohrbach, in a conference held at Berlin some time ago, recommended that Armenia should be evacuated of Armenians. They should be dispersed in the direction of Mesopotamia, and their places should be taken by Turks, in such a fashion that Armenia should be freed of all Russian influence, and that Mesopotamia might be provided with farmers which it now lacked. The purpose of all this was evident enough. Germany was building the Baghdad Railroad across the Mesopotamian desert. This was an essential detail in the achievement of the great new German empire extending from Hamburg to the Persian Gulf. But this railroad could never succeed unless there should develop a thrifty and industrious population to feed it. The lazy Turk would never become such a colonist. But the Armenian was made of just the kind of stuff which this enterprise needed. It was entirely in accordance with the German conception of statesmanship to seize these people in the lands where they had lived for ages and transport them violently to this dreary, hot desert. The mere fact that they had always lived in a temperate climate would furnish no impediment in pan-German eyes. I found that Germany had been sowing those ideas broadcast for several years. I even found that German savants had been lecturing on this subject in the East. I remember attending a lecture by a well-known German professor, an Armenian tells me. His main point was that, throughout their history, the Turks had made a great mistake in being too merciful toward the non-Turkish population. The only way to ensure the prosperity of the empire, according to this speaker, 
was to act without any sentimentality toward all the subject nationalities and races in Turkey who did not fall in with the plans of the Turks. The Pan-Germanists are on record in the matter of Armenia. I shall content myself with quoting the words of the author of Middle Europa, Friedrich Naumann, perhaps the ablest propagator of pan-German ideas. In his work on Asia, Naumann, who started life as a Christian clergyman, deals in considerable detail with the Armenian massacres of 1895 and 1896. I need only quote a few passages to show the attitude of German state policy on such infamies. If we should take into consideration merely the violent massacre of from 80,000 to 100,000 Armenians, writes Naumann, we can come to but one opinion. We must absolutely condemn with anger and vehemence both the assassins and their instigators. They have perpetrated the most abominable massacres upon masses of people, more numerous and worse than those inflicted by Charlemagne on the Saxons. The tortures which Lepsius has described surpass anything we have ever known. What then prohibits us from falling upon the Turk and saying to him, Get thee gone, wretch! Only one thing prohibits us, for the Turk answers, I too, I fight for my existence, and indeed we believe him. We believe, despite the indignation which the bloody Mohammedan barbarism arouses in us, that the Turks are defending themselves legitimately, and, before anything else, we see in the Armenian question and Armenian massacres a matter of internal Turkish policy, merely an episode of the agony through which a great empire is passing, which does not propose to let itself die without making a last attempt to save itself by bloodshed. All the great powers, excepting Germany, have adopted a policy which aims to upset the actual state of affairs in Turkey. In accordance with this, they demand for the subject peoples of Turkey the rights of man, or of humanity, or of civilization, or of political liberty, in a word, something that will make them the equals of the Turks. But just as little as the ancient Roman despotic state could tolerate the Nazarene's religion, just as little can the Turkish Empire, which is really the political successor of the Eastern Roman Empire, tolerate any representation of Western free Christianity among its subjects. The danger for Turkey in the Armenian question is one of extinction. For this reason she resorts to an act of a barbarous Asiatic state, she has destroyed the Armenians to such an extent that they will not be able to manifest themselves as a political force for a considerable period. A horrible act, certainly, an act of political despair, shameful in its details, but still a piece of political history in the Asiatic manner. In spite of the displeasure which the German Christian feels at these accomplished facts, he has nothing to do except quietly to heal the wounds so far as he can, and then to let matters take their course. For a long time our policy in the Orient has been determined. We belong to the group that protects Turkey. That is the fact by which we must regulate our conduct. We do not prohibit any zealous Christian from caring for the victims of these horrible crimes, from bringing up the children and nursing the adults. May God bless these good acts like all other acts of faith. Only we must take care that deeds of charity do not take the form of political acts which are likely to thwart our German policy. The internationalist, he who belongs to the English school of thought, may march with the Armenians. The nationalist, he who does not intend to sacrifice the future of Germany to England, must, on questions of external policy, follow the path marked out by Bismarck, even if it is merciless in its sentiments. National policy, that is the profound moral reason why we must, as statesmen, show ourselves indifferent to the sufferings of the Christian peoples of Turkey,
however painful that may be to our human feelings. That is our duty, which we must recognize and confess before God and before man. If, for this reason, we now maintain the existence of the Turkish state, we do it in our own self-interest, because what we have in mind is our great future. On one side lie our duties as a nation, on the other our duties as men. There are times when, in a conflict of duties, we can choose a middle ground. That is all right from a human standpoint, but rarely right in a moral sense. In this instance, as in all analogous situations, we must clearly know on which side lies the greatest and most important moral duty. Once we have made such a choice, we must not hesitate. William the Second has chosen. He has become the friend of the Sultan because he is thinking of a greater independent Germany. Such was the German state philosophy as applied to the Armenians, and I had the opportunity of observing German practice as well. As soon as the early reports reached Constantinople, it occurred to me that the most feasible way of stopping the outrages would be for the diplomatic representatives of all countries to make a joint appeal to the Ottoman government. I approached Wangenheim on this subject in the latter part of March. His antipathy to the Armenians became immediately apparent. He began denouncing them in unmeasured terms. Like Talat and Enver, he affected to regard the Van episode as an unprovoked rebellion, and, in his eyes, as in theirs, the Armenians were simply traitorous vermin. "'I will help the Zionists,' he said, thinking that this remark would be personally pleasing to me but I shall do nothing whatever for the Armenians. Wangenheim pretended to regard the Armenian question as a matter that chiefly affected the United States. My constant intercession on their behalf apparently created the impression, in his Germanic mind, that any mercy shown this people would be a concession to the American government, and at that moment he was not disposed to do anything that would please the American people. The United States is apparently the only country that takes much interest in the Armenians, he said. Your missionaries are their friends, and your people have constituted themselves their guardians. The whole question of helping them is therefore an American matter. How, then, can you expect me to do anything as long as the United States is selling ammunition to the enemies of Germany? Mr. Bryan has just published his note saying that it would be unneutral not to sell munitions to England and France. As long as your government maintains that attitude, we can do nothing for the Armenians. Probably no one except a German logician would ever have detected any relation between our sale of war materials to the Allies and Turkey's attacks upon hundreds of thousands of Armenian women and children but that was about as much progress as I made with Wangenheim at that time. I spoke to him frequently, but he invariably offset my pleas for mercy to the Armenians by references to the use of American shells at the Dardanelles. A coolness sprang up between us soon afterward, the result of my refusal to give him credit for having stopped the deportation of French and British civilians to the Gallipoli Peninsula. After our somewhat tart conversation over the telephone, when he had asked me to telegraph Washington that he had not hetzed the Turks in this matter, our visits to each other ceased for several weeks. There were certain influential Germans in Constantinople who did not accept Wangenheim's point of view. I have already referred to Paul Weitz, for thirty years the correspondent of the Frankfurter Zeitung, who probably knew more about affairs in the Near East than any other German. Although Wangenheim constantly looked to Weitz for information, he did not always take his advice. Weitz did not accept the orthodox imperial attitude toward Armenia, for he believed that Germany's refusal effectively to intervene was doing his fatherland everlasting injury.
Weitz was constantly presenting this view to Wangenheim, but he made little progress. Weitz told me about this himself in January 1916, a few weeks before I left Turkey. I quote his own words on this subject. "'I remember what you told me at the beginning,' said Weitz. "'What a mistake Germany was making in the Armenian matters. I agreed with you perfectly. But when I urged this view upon Wangenheim, he threw me twice out of the room. Another German who was opposed to the atrocities was Neurath, the consulate of the German embassy. His indignation reached such a point that his language to Talat and Enver became almost undiplomatic. He told me, however, that he had failed to influence them. They are immovable and are determined to pursue their present course, Neurath said. Of course, no Germans could make much impression on the Turkish government as long as the German ambassador refused to interfere. And, as time went on, it became more and more evident that Wangenheim had no desire to stop the deportations. He apparently wished, however, to re-establish friendly relations with me, and soon sent third parties to ask why I never came to see him. I do not know how long this estrangement would have lasted had not a great personal affliction befallen him. In June, Lieutenant Colonel Leipzig, the German military attaché, died under the most tragic and mysterious circumstances in the railroad station at Lulburgas. He was killed by a revolver shot. One story said that the weapon had been accidentally discharged, another that the colonel had committed suicide, still another that the Turks had assassinated him, mistaking him for Liman von Sanders. Leipzig was one of Wangenheim's intimate friends. As young men they had been officers in the same regiment, and at Constantinople they were almost inseparable. I immediately called upon the ambassador to express my condolences. I found him very dejected and careworn. He told me that he had heart trouble, that he was almost exhausted, and that he had applied for a few weeks' leave of absence. I knew that it was not only his comrade's death that was preying upon Wangenheim's mind. German missionaries were flooding Germany with reports about the Armenians and calling upon the government to stop the massacres. Yet, overburdened and nervous as Wangenheim was this day, he gave many signs that he was still the same unyielding German militarist. A few days afterward, when he returned my visit, he asked, "'Where's Kitchener's army? We are willing to surrender Belgium now,' he went on. "'Germany intends to build an enormous fleet of submarines with great cruising radius. In the next war we shall therefore be able completely to blockade England. So we do not need Belgium for its submarine bases. We shall give her back to the Belgians, taking the Congo in exchange.' I then made another plea in behalf of the persecuted Christians. Again we discussed this subject at length. "'The Armenians,' said Wangenheim, "'have shown themselves in this war to be enemies of the Turks. It is quite apparent that the two peoples can never live together in the same country. The Americans should move some of them to the United States, and we Germans will send some to Poland, and in their place send Jewish Poles to the Armenian provinces, that is, if they will promise to drop their Zionist schemes.' Again, although I spoke with unusual earnestness, the ambassador refused to help the Armenians. Still, on July 4th, Wangenheim did present a formal note of protest. He did not talk to Talat or Enver, the only men who had any authority, but to the Grand Vizier, who was merely a shadow. The incident had precisely the same character as his pro forma protest against sending the French and British civilians down to Gallipoli to serve as targets for the Allied fleet. Its only purpose was to put Germans officially on record. Probably the hypocrisy of this protest was more apparent to me than to others, for, at the very moment when Wangenheim presented this so-called protest, he was giving me the reasons why Germany could not take really effective steps to end the massacres. Soon after this interview, Wangenheim received his leave, 
and went to Germany. Callous as Wangenheim showed himself to be, he was not quite so implacable toward the Armenians as the German naval attaché in Constantinople, Humann. This person was generally regarded as a man of great influence. His position in Constantinople corresponded to that of Boyed in the United States. A German diplomat once told me that Humann was more of a Turk than Enver or Talat. Despite this reputation, I attempted to enlist his influence. I appealed to him particularly because he was a friend of Enver, and was generally looked upon as an important connecting link between the German embassy and the Turkish military authorities. Humann was a personal emissary of the Kaiser, in constant communication with Berlin, and undoubtedly he reflected the attitude of the ruling powers in Germany. He discussed the Armenian problem with the utmost frankness and brutality. "'I have lived in Turkey the larger part of my life,' he told me, "'and I know the Armenians. I also know that both Armenians and Turks cannot live together in this country. One of these races has got to go. And I don't blame the Turks for what they are doing to the Armenians. I think that they are entirely justified. The weaker nation must succumb.' The Armenians desire to dismember Turkey. They are against the Turks and the Germans in this war, and they therefore have no right to exist here. I also think that Wangenheim went altogether too far in making a protest. At least I would not have done so. I expressed my horror at such sentiments, but Humann went on abusing the Armenian people and absolving the Turks from all blame. "'It is a matter of safety,' he replied." The Turks have got to protect themselves, and, from this point of view, they are entirely justified in what they are doing. Why, we found seven thousand guns at Karakui, which belonged to the Armenians. At first Enver wanted to treat the Armenians with the utmost moderation, and four months ago he insisted that they be given another opportunity to demonstrate their loyalty. But after what they did at Van, he had to yield to the army— which had been insisting all along that it should protect its rear. The committee decided upon the deportations, and Enver reluctantly agreed. All Armenians are working for the destruction of Turkey's power, and the only thing to do is to deport them. Enver is really a very kind-hearted man. He is incapable personally of hurting a fly. But when it comes to defending an idea which he believes, he will do it fearlessly and recklessly. Moreover, the young Turks have to rid themselves of the Armenians merely as a matter of self-protection. The committee is strong only in Constantinople and a few other large cities. Everywhere else the people are strongly old Turk, and these old Turks are all fanatics. These old Turks are not in favor of the present government, and so the committee has to do everything in their power to protect themselves." but don't think that any harm will come to other Christians. Any Turk can easily pick out three Armenians among a thousand Turks. Humann was not the only important German who expressed this latter sentiment. Intimations began to reach me from many sources that my meddling in behalf of the Armenians was making me more and more unpopular in German officialdom. One day in October, Neurath, the German consulet, called and showed me a telegram which he had just received from the German Foreign Office. This contained the information that Earl Crewe and Earl Cromer had spoken on the Armenians in the House of Lords, and had laid the responsibility for the massacres upon the Germans, and had declared that they had received their information from an American witness. The telegram also referred to an article in the Westminster Gazette, which said that the German consuls at certain places had instigated and even led the attacks, and particularly mentioned Ressler of Aleppo. Neurath said that his government had directed him to obtain a denial of these charges from the American ambassador at Constantinople. I refused to make such a denial, saying that I did not feel called upon to decide officially whether Turkey or Germany was to blame for these crimes. Yet everywhere in diplomatic circles there seemed to be a conviction 
that the American ambassador was responsible for the wide publicity which the Armenian massacres were receiving in Europe and the United States. I have no hesitation in saying that they were right about this. In December, my son, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., paid a visit to the Gallipoli Peninsula, where he was entertained by General Lehmann von Sanders and other German officers. He had hardly stepped into German headquarters when an officer came up to him and said, "'Those are very interesting articles on the Armenian question which your father is writing in the American newspapers.' "'My father has been writing no articles,' my son replied. "'Oh,' said this officer, "'just because his name isn't signed to them doesn't mean that he is not writing them.' Von Zanders also spoke on this subject. "'Your father is making a great mistake,' he said, giving out the facts about what the Turks are doing to the Armenians. That really is not his business. As hints of this kind made no impression on me, the Germans evidently decided to resort to threats. In the early autumn, a Dr. Nosik arrived in Constantinople from Berlin. Dr. Nosik was a German Jew, and came to Turkey evidently to work against the Zionists. After he had talked with me for a few minutes, describing his Jewish activities, I soon discovered that he was a German political agent. He came to see me twice. The first time his talk was somewhat indefinite, the purpose of the call apparently being to make my acquaintance and insinuate himself into my good graces. The second time, after discoursing vaguely on several topics, he came directly to the point. He drew his chair close up to me, and began to talk in the most friendly and confidential manner. "'Mr. Ambassador,' he said, "'we are both Jews, and I want to speak to you as one Jew to another. I hope you will not be offended if I presume upon this to give you a little advice. You are very active in the interest of the Armenians, and I do not think you realize how very unpopular you are becoming for this reason with the authorities here.' In fact, I think that I ought to tell you that the Turkish government is contemplating asking for your recall. Your protests for the Armenians will be useless. The Germans will not interfere for them, and you are just spoiling your opportunity for usefulness, and running the risk that your career will end ignominiously. "'Are you giving me this advice,' I asked, "'because you have real interest in my personal welfare?' "'Certainly,' he answered. All of us Jews are proud of what you have done, and we would hate to see your career end disastrously. Then you go back to the German embassy, I said, and tell Wangenheim what I say, to go ahead and have me recalled. If I am to suffer martyrdom, I can think of no better cause in which to be sacrificed. In fact, I would welcome it, for I can think of no greater honor than to be recalled because I, a Jew, have been exerting all my powers to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of Christians. Dr. Nosik hurriedly left my office, and I have never seen him since. When next I met Enver, I told him that there were rumors that the Ottoman government was about to ask for my recall. He was very emphatic in denouncing the whole story as a falsehood. "'We would not be guilty of making such a ridiculous mistake,' he said. So there was not the slightest doubt that this attempt to intimidate me had been hatched at the German embassy. Wangenheim returned to Constantinople in early October. I was shocked at the changes that had taken place in the man. As I wrote in my diary, he looked the perfect picture of Wotan. His face was almost constantly twitching. He wore a black cover over his right eye, and he seemed unusually nervous and depressed. He told me that he had obtained little rest, that he had been obliged to spend most of his time in Berlin attending to business. A few days after his return I met him on my way to Hasqui. He said that he was going to the American embassy, and together we walked back to it. I had been recently told by Talat that he intended to deport all the Armenians who were left in Turkey, and this statement had induced me to make a final plea to the one man in Constantinople who had the power to end the horrors. I took Wangenheim up to the second floor of the embassy, where we could be entirely alone and uninterrupted, 
and there, for more than an hour, sitting together over the tea-table, we had our last conversation on this subject. "'Berlin telegraphs me,' he said, "'that your Secretary of State tells them that you say that more Armenians than ever had been massacred since Bulgaria has come in on our side.' "'No, I did not cable that,' I replied. "'I admit that I have sent a large amount of information to Washington. I have sent copies of every report and every statement to the State Department. They are safely lodged there, and whatever happens to me, the evidence is complete, and the American people are not dependent on my oral report for their information. But this particular statement you make is not quite accurate.' I merely informed Mr. Lansing that any influence Bulgaria might exert to stop the massacres has been lost, now that she has become Turkey's ally. We again discussed the deportations. Germany is not responsible for this, Wangenheim said. You can assert that to the end of time, I replied, but nobody will believe it. The world will always hold Germany responsible. The guilt of these crimes will be your inheritance forever. I know that you have filed a paper protest, but what does that amount to? You know better than I do that such a protest will have no effect. I do not claim that Germany is responsible for these massacres in the sense that she instigated them, but she is responsible in the sense that she had the power to stop them and did not use it and it is not only America and your present enemies that will hold you responsible. The German people will some day call your government to account. You are a Christian people, and the time will come when Germans will realize that you have let a Mohammedan people destroy another Christian nation. How foolish is your protest that I am sending information to my State Department! Do you suppose that you can keep secret such hellish atrocities as these? Don't get such a silly ostrich-like thought as that. Don't think that by ignoring them yourselves you can get the rest of the world to do so. Crimes like these cry to heaven. Do you think I could know about things like this and not report them to my government? And don't forget that German missionaries, as well as American, are sending me information about the Armenians. All that you say may be true, replied the German ambassador, but the big problem that confronts us is to win this war. Turkey has settled with her foreign enemies. She has done that at the Dardanelles and at Gallipoli. She is now trying to settle her internal affairs. They still greatly fear that the capitulations will again be forced upon them. Before they are again put under this restraint, they intend to have their internal problems in such shape that there will be little chance of any interference from foreign nations. Talat has told me that he is determined to complete this task before peace is declared. In the future they don't intend that the Russians shall be in any position to say that they have a right to intervene about Armenian matters, because there are a large number of Armenians in Russia who are affected by the troubles of their co-religionists in Turkey. Jeers used to be doing this all the time, and the Turks do not intend that any ambassador from Russia or from any other country shall have such an opportunity in the future. The Armenians, anyway, are a very poor lot. You come in contact in Constantinople with Armenians of the educated classes, and you get your impressions about them from these men— but all the Armenians are not of that type. Yet I admit that they have been treated terribly. I sent a man to make investigations, and he reported that the worst outrages have not been committed by Turkish officials, but by brigands. Wangenheim again suggested that the Armenians be taken to the United States, and once more I gave him the reasons why this would be impracticable. Never mind all these considerations, I said. Let us disregard everything, military necessity, state policy, and all else, and let us look upon this simply as a human problem. Remember that most of the people who are being treated in this way are old men, old women, and helpless children. Why can't you, as a human being, see that these people are permitted to live? 
"'At the present stage of internal affairs in Turkey,' Wangenheim replied, "'I shall not intervene.' I saw that it was useless to discuss the matter further. He was a man who was devoid of sympathy and human pity, and I turned from him in disgust. Wangenheim rose to leave. As he did so, he gave a gasp, and his legs suddenly shot from under him. I jumped and caught the man just as he was falling. For a minute he seemed utterly dazed. He looked at me in a bewildered way, then suddenly collected himself and regained his poise. I took the ambassador by the arm, piloted him down the stairs, and put him into his auto. By this time he had apparently recovered from his dizzy spell, and he reached home safely. Two days afterward, while sitting at his dinner-table, he had a stroke of apoplexy. He was carried upstairs to his bed, but he never regained consciousness. On October 24th I was officially informed that Wangenheim was dead. And thus my last recollection of Wangenheim is that of the ambassador, as he sat in my office in the American embassy, absolutely refusing to exert any influence to prevent the massacre of a nation. He was the one man, and his government was the one government that could have stopped these crimes, but, as Wangenheim told me many times, our one aim is to win this war. A few days afterward official Turkey and the diplomatic force paid their last tribute to this perfect embodiment of the Prussian system. The funeral was held in the garden of the German embassy at Pera. The enclosure was filled with flowers. Practically the whole gathering, excepting the family and the ambassadors and the sultan's representatives, remained standing during the simple but impressive ceremonies. Then the procession formed. German sailors carried the beer upon their shoulders, other German sailors carried the huge bunches of flowers, and all members of the diplomatic corps and the officials of the Turkish government followed on foot. The Grand Vizier led the procession. I walked the whole way with Enver. All the officers of the Gerben and the Breslau, and all the German generals, dressed in full uniform, followed. It seemed as though the whole of Constantinople lined the streets, and the atmosphere had some of the quality of a holiday. We walked to the grounds of Dolma Bagcha, the Sultan's palace, passing through the gate which the ambassadors enter when presenting their credentials. At the dock a steam-launch lay awaiting our arrival, and in this stood Neurath, the German consulate, ready to receive the body of his dead chieftain. The coffin, entirely covered with flowers, was placed in the boat. As the launch sailed out into the stream, Neurath, a six-foot Prussian, dressed in his military uniform, his helmet a waving mass of white plumes, stood erect and silent. Wangenheim was buried in the park of the summer embassy at Therapia by the side of his comrade Colonel Leipzig. No final resting place would have been more appropriate, for this had been the scene of his diplomatic successes, and it was from this place that, a little more than two years before, he had directed by wireless the Gerben and the Breslau, and safely brought them into Constantinople, thus making it inevitable that Turkey should join forces with Germany, and paving the way for all the triumphs and all the horrors that have necessarily followed that event. End of chapter 27《ハッピーニュースプロジェクト》Chapter 28 of Ambassador Morgenthau This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Enver again moves for peace. Farewell to the Sultan and to Turkey. My failure to stop the destruction of the Armenians had made Turkey for me a place of horror, and I found intolerable my further daily association with men who, however gracious and accommodating and good-natured they might have been to the American ambassador, were still reeking with the blood of nearly a million human beings. Could I have done anything more, either for Americans, enemy aliens, or the persecuted peoples of the empire, I would willingly have stayed. 
The position of Americans and Europeans, however, had now become secure, and, so far as the subject peoples were concerned, I had reached the end of my resources. Moreover, an event was approaching in the United States which, I believed, would inevitably have the greatest influence upon the future of the world and of democracy, the presidential campaign. I felt that there was nothing so important in international politics as the re-election of President Wilson. I could imagine no greater calamity for the United States and the world than that the American nation should fail to endorse heartily this great statesman. If I could substantially assist in Mr. Wilson's re-election, I concluded that I could better serve my country at home at this juncture. I had another practical reason for returning home, and that was to give the President and the State Department, by word of mouth, such first-hand information as I possessed on the European situation. It was especially important to give them the latest sidelights on the subject of peace, in the latter part of 1915 and the early part of 1916, this was the uppermost topic in Constantinople. Enver Pasha was constantly asking me to intercede with the President to end the war. Several times he intimated that Turkey was war-weary, and that its salvation depended on getting an early peace. I have already described the conditions that prevailed a few months after the outbreak of the war, but by the end of 1915 they were infinitely worse. When Turkey decided on the deportation and massacre of her subject peoples, especially the Armenians and the Greeks, she had signed her own economic death warrant. These were the people, as I have already said, who controlled her industries and her finances and developed her agriculture, and the material consequences of this great national crime now began to be everywhere apparent. The farms were lying uncultivated, and daily thousands of peasants were dying of starvation. As the Armenians and Greeks were the largest taxpayers, their annihilation greatly reduced the state revenues, and the fact that practically all Turkish ports were blockaded had shut off customs collections. The mere statement that Turkey was barely taking in money enough to pay the interest on her debt, to say nothing of ordinary expenses and war expenses, gives a fair idea of her advanced degree of exhaustion. In these facts Turkey had abundant reasons for desiring a speedy peace. Besides this, Enver and the ruling party feared a revolution, unless the war quickly came to an end. As I wrote the State Department about this time, these men are willing to do almost anything to retain their power. Still, I did not take Enver's importunities for peace any too seriously. "'Are you speaking for yourself and your party in this matter?' I asked him. "'Or do you really speak for Germany also? I cannot submit a proposition from you unless the Germans are back of you. Have you consulted them about this?' No, Enver replied, but I know how they feel. That is not sufficient, I answered. You had better communicate with them directly through the German embassy. I would not be willing to submit a proposition that was not endorsed by all the Teutonic allies. Enver thought that it would be almost useless to discuss the matter with the German ambassador. He said, however, that he was just leaving for Orsova, a town on the Hungarian and Romanian frontier, where he was to have a conference with Falkenhayn, at that time the German chief of staff. Falkenhayn, said Enver, was the important man. He would take up the question of peace with him. Why do you think that it is a good time to discuss peace now? I asked. Because in two weeks we shall have completely annihilated Serbia. We think that should put the Allies in a frame of mind to discuss peace. My visit to Falkenhayn is to complete arrangements for the invasion of Egypt. In a very few days we expect Greece to join us. We are already preparing tons of provisions and fodder to send to Greece. And when we get Greece, of course, Romania will come in. When the Greeks and Romanians join us, we shall have a million fresh troops. We shall get all the guns and ammunition we need from Germany as soon as the direct railroad is opened. 
All these things make it an excellent time for us to take up the matter of peace. I asked the Minister of War to talk the matter over with Falkenhayn at his proposed interview, and report to me when he returned. In some way this conversation came to the ears of the new German ambassador, Graf Wolf Metternich, who immediately called to discuss the subject. He apparently wished to impress upon me two things, that Germany would never surrender Alsace-Lorraine, and that she would insist on the return of all her colonies. I replied that it was apparently useless to discuss peace until England first had won some great military victory. That may be so, replied the Graf, but you can hardly expect that Germany shall let England win such a victory merely to put her in a frame of mind to consider peace. But I think that you are wrong. It is a mistake to say that Great Britain has not already won great victories. I think that she has several very substantial ones to her credit. Just consider what she has done. She has established her unquestioned supremacy of the seas, and driven off all German commerce. She has not only not lost a foot of her own territory, but she has gained enormous new domains. She has annexed Cyprus and Egypt, and has conquered all the German colonies. She is in possession of a considerable part of Mesopotamia. How absurd to say that England has gained nothing by the war! On December 1st, Enver came to the American embassy and reported the results of his interview with Falkenhayn. The German chief of staff had said that Germany would very much like to discuss peace, but that Germany could not state her terms in advance, as such an action would be generally interpreted as a sign of weakness. But one thing could be depended on. The Allies could obtain far more favorable terms at that moment than at any future time. Enver told me that the Germans would be willing to surrender all the territory they had taken from the French, and practically all of Belgium. But the one thing on which they had definitely settled was the permanent dismemberment of Serbia. Not an acre of Macedonia would be returned to Serbia, and even parts of old Serbia would be retained. That is, Serbia would become a much smaller country than she had been before the Balkan Wars, and, in fact, she would practically disappear as an independent state. The meaning of all this was apparent even then. Germany had won the object for which she had really gone to war, a complete route from Berlin to Constantinople and the East. Part, and a good part, of the pan-German Mitteleuropa had thus become an accomplished military fact. Apparently, Germany was willing to give up the overrun provinces of northern France and Belgium, provided that the Entente would consent to her retention of these conquests. The proposal which Falkenhayn made then did not materially differ from that which Germany had put forward in the latter part of 1914. This Enver Falkenhayn interview, as reported to me, shows that it was no suddenly conceived German plan, but that it has been Germany's scheme from the first. In all this, I saw no particular promise of an early peace. Yet I thought that I should lay these facts before the President. I therefore applied to Washington for a leave of absence, which was granted. I had my farewell interview with Enver and Talat on the 13th of January. Both men were in their most delightful mood. Evidently both were turning over in their minds, as was I, all the momentous events that had taken place in Turkey and in the world since my first meeting with them two years before. Then Talat and Enver were merely desperate adventurers who had reached high position by assassination and intrigue. Their position was insecure, for at any moment another revolution might plunge them into the obscurity from which they had sprung. But now they were the unquestioned despots of the Ottoman Empire, the allies of the then strongest military power in the world, the conquerors, absurdly enough they so regarded themselves, of the British Navy. At this moment of their great triumph, the Allied expedition to the Dardanelles had evacuated its positions only two weeks before, both Talat and Enver regarded their country again as a world power. "'I hear you are going home to spend a lot of money and re-elect your president,' said Talat, 
this being a jocular reference to the fact that I was the chairman of the Finance Committee of the Democratic National Committee. That's very foolish. Why don't you stay here and give it to Turkey? We need it more than your people do. But we hope you are coming back soon, he added, in the polite and insincere manner of the Oriental. You and we have really grown up together. You came here about the same time that we took office, and we don't know how we could ever get so well acquainted with another man. We have grown fond of you, too. We have had our differences, and pretty lively ones at times, but we have always found you fair, and we respect American policy in Turkey, as you have represented it. We don't like to see you go, even for a few months. I expressed my pleasure at these words. "'It's very nice to hear you talk that way,' I answered. "'Since you flatter me so much, I know that you will be willing to promise me certain things. Since I have you both here together, this is my chance to put you on record. Will you treat the people in my charge considerately, just the same as though I were here?' "'As to the American missionaries in colleges and schools,' said Talat, and Enver assented, "'we give you an absolute promise.' They will not be molested in the slightest degree, but can go on doing their work just the same as before. Your mind can rest easy on that score. "'How about the British and French?' I asked. "'Oh, well,' said Talat, smiling, "'we may have to have a little fun with them now and then. But don't worry, we'll take good care of them.' And now, for the last time, I spoke on the subject that had rested so heavily on my mind for many months— I feared that another appeal would be useless, but I decided to make it. How about the Armenians? Talat's geniality disappeared in an instant. His face hardened, and the fire of the beast lighted up his eyes once more. What's the use of speaking about them, he said, waving his hand. We are through with them. That's all over. Such was my farewell with Talat. That's all over, were his last words to me. The next day I had my farewell audience with the Sultan. He was the same gracious, kindly old gentleman whom I had first met two years before. He received me informally in civilian European clothes, and asked me to sit down with him. We talked for twenty minutes, and discussed, among other things, the pleasant relations that prevailed between America and Turkey. He thanked me for the interest which I had taken in his country, and hoped that I would soon return. Then he took up the question of war and peace. "'Every monarch naturally desires peace,' he said. "'None of us approves the shedding of blood. But there are times when war seems unavoidable. We may wish to settle our disputes amicably, but we cannot always do it. This seems to be one of them.' I told the British ambassador that we did not wish to go to war with his country. I tell you the same thing now. But Turkey had to defend her rights. Russia attacked us, and naturally we had to defend ourselves. Thus the war was not the result of any planning on our part. It was an act of Allah. It was fate. I expressed the hope that it might soon be over. Yes, we wish peace also, replied His Majesty but it must be a peace that will guarantee the rights of our empire. I am sure that a civilized and flourishing country like America wants peace, and she should exert all her efforts to bring about a peace that shall be permanent. One of the Sultan's statements at this interview left a lasting impression. This was his assertion that Russia attacked us. That the simple-minded old gentleman believed this was apparent, it was also clear that he knew nothing of the real facts, that Turkish warships, under German officers, had plunged Turkey into the war by bombarding Russian seaports. Instead of telling him the truth, the young Turk leaders had foisted upon the Sultan this fiction of Russia as the aggressor. The interview showed precisely to what extent the ostensible ruler of Turkey was acquainted with the crucial facts in the government of his own empire. In our interview, Talat and Enver had not said their final farewells, telling me that they would meet me at the station. A few minutes before the train started, Bedri came up, rather pale-faced and excited, and brought me their apologies. 
They cannot come, he said. The crown prince has just committed suicide. I knew the crown prince well, and I had expected to have him as a fellow passenger to Berlin. He had been about to make a trip to Germany, and his special car was attached to this train. I had seen much of Yusuf Izadin. He had several times invited me to call upon him, and we had spent many hours talking over the United States and American institutions, in which subject he had always displayed the keenest interest. Many times he had told me that he would like to introduce certain American governmental ideas in Turkey. This morning, when we were leaving for Berlin, the crown prince was found lying on the floor in his villa, bathed in a pool of blood, with his arteries cut. Yusuf was the son of Abdul Aziz, sultan from 1861 to 1876, who, gruesomely enough, had ended his days by opening his arteries forty years before. The circumstances surrounding the death of father and son were precisely the same. The fact that Yusuf was strongly pro-ally, that he had opposed Turkey's participation in the war on Germany's side, and that he was extremely antagonistic to the Committee of Union and Progress, gave rise to many suspicions. I know nothing about the stories that now went from mouth to mouth, and merely record that the official report on the death was that it was a case of suicide. On la suicide, they have suicided him, remarked a witty Frenchman, when this verdict was reported. This tragic announcement naturally cast a gloom over our party, as our train pulled out of Constantinople, but the journey proved to be full of interest. I was now on the famous Balkansuk, and this was only the second trip which it had made to Berlin. My room was number 13. Several people came to look at it, telling me that, on the outward trip, the train had been shot at, and a window of my compartment broken. Soon after we started, I discovered that Admiral Usedom was one of my fellow passengers. Usedom had had a distinguished career in the Navy. Among other things, he had been captain of the Hohenzollern, the Kaiser's yacht, and thus was upon friendly terms with His Majesty. The last time I had seen Usedom was on my visit to the Dardanelles, where he had been Inspector General of the Ottoman Defences. As soon as we met again, the Admiral began to talk about the abortive Allied attack. He again made no secret of the fears which he had then entertained that this attack would succeed. Several times, he said, we thought that they were on the verge of getting through. All of us down there were very much distressed and depressed over the prospect. We owed much to the heroism of the Turks, and their willingness to sacrifice an unlimited number of human lives. It is all over now. That part of our task is finished. The Admiral thought that the British landing party had been badly prepared, though he spoke admiringly of the skill with which the Allies had managed their retreat. I also obtained further light on the German attitude toward the Armenian massacres. Usedom made no attempt to justify them, neither did he blame the Turks. He discussed the whole thing calmly, dispassionately, merely as a military problem, and one would never have guessed from his remarks that the lives of a million human beings had been involved. He simply said that the Armenians were in the way, that they were an obstacle to German success, and that it had been therefore necessary to remove them, just like so much useless lumber. He spoke about them as detachedly as one would speak about removing a row of houses in order to bombard a city. Poor Serbia! As our train sped through her devastated districts, I had a picture of what the war had meant to this brave little country. In the last two years this nation had stood alone, practically unassisted by her allies, attempting to stem the rush of pan-German conquest, just as, for several centuries, she had stood as a bulwark against the onslaughts of the Turks. And she had paid the penalty. Many farms we passed were abandoned, overgrown with weeds and neglected, and the buildings were frequently roofless, and sometimes raised to the ground. Whenever we crossed a stream we saw the remains of a dynamited bridge, 
In all cases the Germans had built new ones to replace those which had been destroyed. We saw many women and children, looking ragged and half-starved, but, significantly, we saw very few men, for all had either been killed or they were in the ranks of Serbia's still existing and valiant little army. All this time trains full of German soldiers were passing us or standing on the switches at the stations where we slowed up, a sufficient explanation for all the misery and devastation we saw on our way. End of chapter 28《チャプター29of Ambassador Morgenthau's Story by Henry Morgenthau》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Von Jagau, Zimmermann, and German Americans Our train drew in to the Berlin station on the evening of February 2, 1916. The date is worth mentioning, for that marked an important crisis in German-American relations. Almost the first man I met was my old friend and colleague, Ambassador James W. Gerard. Mr. Gerard told me that he was packing up and expected to leave Berlin at any moment, for he believed that a break between Germany and the United States was a matter only of days, perhaps of hours. At that time Germany and the United States were discussing the settlement of the Lusitania outrage. The negotiations had reached a point where the imperial government had expressed a willingness to express her regrets, pay an indemnity, and promise not to do it again. But the President and Mr. Lansing insisted that Germany should declare that the sinking of the Lusitania had been an illegal act. This meant that Germany at no time in the future could resume submarine warfare without stultifying herself and doing something which her own government had denounced as contrary to international law. But our government would accept nothing less, and the two nations were, therefore, at loggerheads. "'I can do nothing more,' said Mr. Gerard. "'I want to have a talk with Zimmermann and von Jagau, and perhaps you can give them a new point of view.' I soon discovered, from my many callers, that the atmosphere in Berlin was tense and exceedingly anti-American. Our country was regarded everywhere as practically an ally of the Entente, and I found that the most absurd ideas prevailed concerning the closeness of our relations with England. Thus it was generally believed that Sir Cecil Spring Rice, the British ambassador in Washington, met regularly with President Wilson's cabinet, and was consulted on all our national policies. At three o'clock Mr. Gerard took me to Fonyaga's house, and we spent more than an hour there with the foreign minister. Fonyaga was a small, slight man of nervous disposition. He lighted cigarette after cigarette during our interview. He was apparently greatly worried over the American situation. Let us not suppose that the German government regarded lightly a break with the United States. At that time their newspapers were ridiculing and insulting us, and making fun of the idea that Uncle Sam would go to war. The contrast between these journalistic vaporings and the anxiety, even the fear, which this high German official displayed, much impressed me. The prospect of having our men and our resources thrown on the side of the Entente he did not regard indifferently, whatever the Berlin press might say. It seems to us a shame that Mr. Lansing should insist that we declare the Lusitania sinking illegal, von Jagau began. He is acting like a technical lawyer. If you want the real truth, I replied, I do not think that the United States is particular or technical about the precise terms that you use but you must give definite assurances that you are sorry for the act, say that you regard it as an improper one, and that it will not occur again. Unless you do this, the United States will not be satisfied. We cannot do that, he answered. Public opinion in Germany would not permit it. If we should make a declaration such as you outline, the present cabinet would fall. "'But I thought that you had public opinion here well under control,' I answered. "'It may take a little time, but—' 
certainly you can change public sentiment so that it would approve such a settlement. As far as the newspapers are concerned, said von Jagau, that is true. We can absolutely control them. However, that will take some time. The newspapers cannot reverse themselves immediately. They will have to do it gradually, taking two or three weeks. We can manage them, but there are members of Parliament who we can't control, and they would make so much trouble that we would all have to resign. Yet it seems to me, I rejoined, that you could get these members together, explain to them the necessity of keeping the United States out of the war, and that they would be convinced. The trouble is that you Germans don't understand conditions in my country. You don't think that the United States will fight. You don't understand President Wilson. You think that he is an idealist and a peace man, and that under no circumstances will he take up arms. You are making the greatest and most costly mistake that any nation could make. The President has two sides to his nature. Do not forget that he has Scotch-Irish blood in him. Up to the present you have seen only the Scotch side of him. That makes him very cautious, makes him weigh every move, makes him patient and long-suffering. But he has also all the fire and combativeness of the Irish. Let him once set his jaws, and it takes a crowbar to open them again. If he once decides to fight, he will fight with all his soul and to the bitter end. You can go just so far with your provocations, but no farther. You are also greatly deceived because certain important members of Congress, perhaps even a member of the Cabinet, have been for peace. But there is one man who is going to settle this matter, that is the President. He will settle it as he thinks right and just, irrespective of what other people may say or do. Fonyagao said that I had given him a new impression of the President, but he still had one more reason to believe that the United States would not go to war. How about the German-Americans? he asked. I can tell you all about them, I answered, because I am one of them myself. I was born in Germany and spent the first nine years of my life here. I have always loved many things German, such as its music and its literature, but my parents left this country because they were dissatisfied and unhappy here. The United States gave us a friendly reception and a home, and made us prosperous and happy. There are many millions just like us. There is no business opportunity and no social position that is not open to us. I do not believe that there is a more contented people in the world than the German-Americans. I could not reveal to him my own state of mind, as I was still ambassador, but I could and did say, Take my own children. Their sympathies all through this war have been with England and her allies. My son is here with me. He tells me that, if the United States goes to war, he will enlist immediately. Do you suppose, in case we should go to war with Germany, that they would side with you? The idea is simply preposterous, and the overwhelming mass of German-Americans feel precisely the same way. But I am told, said von Jagau, that there will be an insurrection of German-Americans if your country makes war on us. Dismiss any such idea from your mind, I replied. The first one who attempts it will be punished so promptly and so drastically that such a movement will not go far. And I think that the loyal German-Americans themselves will be the first to administer such punishment. We wish to avoid a rupture with the United States, said von Jagau, but we must have time to change public sentiment here. There are two parties here holding diametrically opposed views on submarine warfare. One believes in pushing it to the limit, irrespective of consequences to the United States or any other power. The present cabinet takes the contrary view. We wish to meet the contentions of your president, but the militaristic faction is pushing us hard. They will force us out of office if we declare the Lusitania sinking illegal or improper. I think that President Wilson should understand this. We are working with him, but we must go cautiously. I should suppose that, 
Mr. Wilson, since he wishes to avoid a break, would prefer to have us in power. Why should he take a stand that will drive us out of office and put in here men who will make war inevitable between Germany and the United States? Do you wish Washington to understand, I asked, that your tenure of office depends on your not making this declaration? We certainly do, replied von Jagau. I wish that you would telegraph Washington to that effect. Tell the President that, if we are displaced now, we shall be succeeded by men who advocate unlimited submarine warfare. He expressed himself as amazed by my description of President Wilson and his willingness to fight. We regard him, said von Jagau, as absolutely a man of peace. Nor do we believe that the American people will fight. They are far from the scene of action, and what, after all, have they to fight for? Your material interests are not affected. But there is one thing that we will fight for, I replied, and that is moral principle. It is quite apparent that you do not understand the American spirit. You do not realize that we are holding off, not because we have no desire to fight, but because we wish to be absolutely fair. We first wish to have all the evidence in. I admit that we are reluctant to mix in foreign disputes, but we shall insist upon our right to use the ocean as we see fit, and we don't propose to have Germany constantly interfering with that right and murdering our citizens. The American is still perhaps a great, powerful youth, but once he gets his mind made up that he is going to defend his rights, he will do so irrespective of consequences. You seem to think that Americans will not fight for a principle. You apparently have forgotten that all our wars have been over matters of principle. Take the greatest of them all, the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. We in the North fought to emancipate the slaves. That was purely a matter of principle. Our material interests were not involved, and we fought that to the end, although we had to fight our own brothers. We don't want to be on bad terms with the United States, Fonyaga replied. There are three nations on whom the peace of the world depends, England, the United States, and Germany. We three should get together, establish peace, and maintain it. I thank you for your explanation. I understand the situation much better now. But I still don't see why your government is so hard on Germany, and so easy with England. I made the usual explanation that we regarded our problem with each nation as a distinct matter, and could not make our treatment of Germany in any way conditional on our treatment of England. Oh, yes, replied von Jagau, rather plaintively. It reminds me of two boys playing in a yard. One is to be punished first, and the other is waiting for his turn. Wilson is going to spank the German boy first, and after he gets through, then he proposes to take up England. However, he concluded, I wish you would cable the President that you have gone over the matter with me, and now understand the German point of view. Won't you please ask him to do nothing until you have reached the other side, and explained the whole thing personally? I made this promise, and Mr. Gerard and I cabled immediately. At four thirty o'clock, I had an engagement to take tea with Dr. Alexander and his wife at their home. I had been there about fifteen minutes when Zimmerman was announced. He was a different kind of man from von Jagau. He impressed me as much stronger, mentally and physically. He was tall, even stately in his bearing, masterful in his manner, direct and searching in his questions, but extremely pleasing and insinuating. Zimmerman, discussing the German-American situation, began with a statement which I presume he thought would be gratifying to me. He told me how splendidly the Jews had behaved in Germany during the war, and how deeply under obligations the Germans felt to them. After the war, he said, they are going to be much better treated in Germany than they have been. Zimmermann told me that von Jagau had told him about our talk, and asked me to repeat part of it. He was particularly interested, he said, in my statements about German-Americans, 
and he wished to learn from me himself the facts upon which I based my conclusions. Like most Germans, he regarded the Germanic elements in our population as almost a part of Germany. Are you sure that the mass of German Americans would be loyal to the United States in case of war? he asked. Aren't their feelings for the fatherland really dominant? You evidently regard those German Americans as a distinct part of the population, I replied, living apart from the rest of the people and having very little to do with American life as a whole. You could not make a greater mistake. You can purchase a few here and there who will make a big noise and shout for Germany, but I am talking about the millions of Americans of German ancestry. These people regard themselves as Americans and nothing else. The second generation particularly resent being looked upon as Germans. It is practically impossible to make them talk German. They refuse to speak anything but English. They do not read German newspapers and will not go to German schools. They even resent going to Lutheran schools where the language is German. We have more than a million German Americans in New York City, but it has been a great struggle to keep alive one German theater. The reason is that these people prefer the theaters where English is the language. We have a few German clubs, but their membership is very small. The German Americans prefer to belong to the clubs of general membership, and there is not a single one in New York, even the finest, where they are not received upon their merits. In the political and social life of New York, there are few German Americans who, as such, have acquired any prominent position, though there are plenty of men of distinguished position who are German in origin. If the United States and Germany go to war, you will not only be surprised at the loyalty of our German people, but the whole world will be. Another point, if the United States goes in, we shall fight to the end, and it will be a very long and a very determined struggle. After three years I have no reason to be ashamed of either of these prophecies. I sometimes wonder what Zimmerman now thinks of my statements. After the explanation, Zimmerman began to talk about Turkey. He seemed interested to find out whether the Turks were likely to make a separate peace. I bluntly told him that the Turks felt themselves to be under no obligations to the Germans. This gave me another opportunity. I have learned a good deal about German methods in Turkey, I said. I think it would be a great mistake to attempt similar tactics in the United States. I speak of this because there has been a good deal of sabotage there already. This in itself is solidifying the German Americans against you, and is more than anything else driving the United States into the arms of England. But the German government is not responsible, said Zimmerman. We know nothing about it. Of course, I could not accept that statement on its face value. Recent developments have shown how mendacious it was. But we passed to other topics. The matter of the submarine came up again. We have voluntarily interned our navy, said Zimmerman. We can do nothing at sea except with our submarines. It seems to me that the United States is making a serious mistake in so strongly opposing the submarine. You have a long coastline, and you may need the U-boat yourself some day. Suppose one of the European powers, or particularly Japan, should attack you. You could use the submarine to good purpose then. Besides, if you insist on this proposed declaration in the Lusitania matter, you will simply force our government into the hands of the Tirpitz party. Zimmerman now returned again to the situation in Turkey. His questions showed that he was much displeased with the new German ambassador, Graf Wolf Metternich. Metternich, it seemed, had failed in his attempt to win the good will of the ruling powers in Turkey, and had been a trial to the German Foreign Office. Metternich had shown a different attitude toward the Armenians from Wangenheim, and he had made sincere attempts with Talat and Enver to stop the massacres. Zimmermann now told me that Metternich had made a great mistake in doing this, and had destroyed his influence at Constantinople. Zimmermann made no effort to conceal his displeasure over Metternich's manifestation of a humanitarian spirit. 
I now saw that Wangenheim had really represented the attitude of official Berlin, and I thus had confirmation, from the highest German authority, of my conviction that Germany had acquiesced in those deportations. In a few days we had taken the steamer at Copenhagen, and on February 22, 1916, I found myself once more sailing into New York Harbor and home. End of chapter 29 and end of Ambassador Morgenthau's story. This recording is dedicated to Dr. Tanner Akcham, author of A Shameful Act. Recorded by Margaret Espayat in Orlando, Florida.